Hey, Campfire crew, let's get it on. My Girlfriend's Past Comes Back, submitted by Roger Moore 76. First things first, none of the names in this are the real names for obvious reasons. This happened about 10 years ago with my then girlfriend. I still talk to her, not for what I'm about to tell you that much, but well, we parted ways for straightforward reasons, and it was hard at first just being friends, but hey, we still are. I met Jean at school. I played baseball and she was on the softball team. Both of our groups were having their pictures taken for the yearbook one day, and we were sophomores and Jean was new to our school and became really popular very quickly, as she was very pretty. Interesting to look back and see how that works. Good-looking new kids always seem to blend in with the in crowd while the others rarely get a nod from them. Anyway, that's neither here nor there. So we bumped into each other on our way to our fields and struck up a cheesy conversation. Mind you, I was friends with a lot of the cool kids, but I really wasn't in their inner circle. I was just a guy who got along with everyone, but wasn't being voted for prom king or whatever. Gene and I had knocked our bats together, and for those of you who know that ping sound metal bats make, well, it was super loud. She was walking with her teammates, as was I, and we both laughed at how everyone was startled by the noise. I introduced myself and said something stupid like, Welcome to our town, immediately regretting it as she had been there since the beginning of school and it was now the end of March. She didn't care though and said thanks. She then said she had seen me in band class. I was a drummer, but she never had a chance to meet everyone at school. I mean, that made sense. Our class alone had about 700 kids in it. We stood talking despite our friends yelling at us to get to practice and I asked where she lived. She told me, and it wasn't all that far from my neighborhood. She said she had to go, but it was nice chatting with me, and then out of nowhere she gave me her number and said to call her that night. I said it back a few times to memorize it, and she smiled and ran off to her field. Alright, without being too mushy, does everyone remember that feeling you got at that age when you realize you like someone and you're pretty sure they like you back? Well, there I was. That night, I called her after I got some homework done, and we talked for over an hour about school and music. She played clarinet, but was really into metal, and I thought that was cool. When she had to get going, she did what always blows guys away. She asked me if I'd like to get together that weekend to hang out. I said yeah, and we'd talk about it in school. I mean, cloud nine going to sleep that night. Jean was girl next door beautiful. I mean, she looked like Doris Day, to tell the truth. I wasn't a slouch myself, but certainly not as hot as other guys at school, at least that's what I thought. I hadn't had a girlfriend in about a year and was hoping that maybe we'd become boyfriend and girlfriend. And after that weekend, we did. That weekend, we met at the mall with some of her friends and some of my pals. It didn't take long for us to leave the group and start wandering around the mall laughing and talking. She was very innocent and shy at first, but that went away after a half hour of hanging out. I would soon find out why she was shy and didn't have a boyfriend. Okay, this has been a lot of backstory, I know, but it's pretty important. I just want to make sure everyone knows that we started our relationship on a completely clean slate and I knew nothing about her past. So speed up to a month later and we're an item now and it was about this time that she told me that she was adopted and she had spent a lot of her life in foster care. Her parents had drug issues and she was taken away from them. I didn't press her on things, but I did ask how she felt about it and stuff like that. She'd been put in foster care when she was six, so it had been some time since she'd seen her parents, although they tried to get her back a number of times. Then I guess they just gave up. She had been with two other families before being adopted by her current parents, and was happy to be with them and in our town for good. Again, I didn't ask too too much, but she hinted that her last foster family was a little messed up. I would see how messed up firsthand, unfortunately. One night, we went out to the movies, and afterwards we decided to walk around the mall the theaters were in until it closed. Just normal teenage evening. We were in a Spencer's Gifts laughing at all the silly stuff in there, when she looked over my shoulder and froze. 
I asked her what was wrong, but she just flipped her hoodie up over her head, put her head down, grabbed my hand, and led me out of the store. She kept her head down until we were a bunch of stores away from Spencer's, and Jean said we needed to leave. I asked her again what was wrong, but she just said we had to go. And we left, got to my dad's car, and got in. She burst into tears and leaned over into me. I hugged her and asked her what was wrong. She kept crying and said she'd tell me later. That's when there was a tapping on the window of the car. I looked up to see this guy, long greasy hair, creepy looking, just standing there tapping on the window with a quarter or some kind of coin. Jean looks over at him too and says, Dennis, just go, go, go! I turn the car on and start backing out with this guy still standing there, staring at us with that creepy grin on his face. Jean was back to crying and I was totally confused as to what was going on. I get on the highway back towards her house and say, you have to tell me what's going on. She took a few deep breaths and said, that guy, that guy back there was my foster brother. He did things to me, did bad things to me. Not wanting her to get too worked up, I didn't say much and just let her talk. She told me about how when she was put in the foster home, this guy, I'll call him Bob, seemed really nice at first. He was older and seemed to be protective. There was also a younger brother in the family too. But after about a month, Bob started to act weird. She said he would creep into her room at night and she'd wake up and he'd be just sitting at her little makeup desk staring at her. Wanting to scream but also not wanting to cause a fuss, she would just whisper for him to leave, and he would. But then he began touching her inappropriately, and it was making her cringe. So she told her foster parents that it was getting weird with Bob, but they blew it off and said that he just liked her, and it was just hugging. One day, the mother was getting ready to go out with the father, and became frantic that a valuable necklace was missing from her jewelry chest. Jean says that her foster mother went through every room in the house looking for it, but couldn't find it and was really distressed. I guess it was a family heirloom that was really pricey. Well, the parents still went out that night, and Bob came into Jean's room and woke her up while she was asleep. She asked him what he was doing, and he held up the necklace and said, This is going to be found in your room, unless... And he pointed to his crotch. Jean said no freaking way, and he simply said, Okay, who do you think they're going to believe, me or you? I can't imagine how she felt. I can't imagine the fear of having to go back with another foster family. I'm sad to say, she did do something to Bob that she wasn't proud of, and then cried herself to sleep. Something similar happened two more times, but she finally got adopted and was out of there. She told a caseworker what had happened, and that person followed up, but I guess the family was outraged and threatened all kinds of stuff. I think it's important to point out now that all of this happened in a city about an hour away from ours, so why this guy was at the mall that night made no sense. I got mad and wanted to go back to kick the guy's ass, but Jean begged me to let it go, so I did. She calmed down, and by that time we were at her house, so we went inside and hung out until I had to go home. The following week, we both had games, and mine ended earlier than hers, so I jogged over to watch her play. There was only an inning left, and I clumped up onto the bleachers and looked for her in the field. But what I immediately saw was Bob, standing along the fence on the other side of the field. That creepy fucker was standing there with his hand in his pants. I jumped up and ran around the backstop, but he had obviously seen me and was hauling ass for the parking lot. I can't tell you how pissed off I was. And I was unsure if I should tell Jean. I didn't want to freak her out any more than she already had been. So, instead, I told my dad about it later when I got home, and he said he was going to call Jean's dad and let him know what was going on just to be safe. A couple of days later, Jean and I went to the library to study, and then went outside behind it where there was a creek and some benches. We were talking and making out a little because no one was around when a huge splash interrupted us, and we both looked up to see Bob on the other side of the creek. He'd thrown something in the water, and was now standing there waving and flashing that creepy fucking smile. Jean gave out a little shriek, 
and I pulled her up and back into the library where I said, screw this, I'm calling the cops. So I did and explained what was going on, and they came out and looked around, but there was no trace of Bob. The cops told us to keep them informed if anything else happened, but at that point, the guy hadn't done anything illegal, and there wasn't much they could do. That was not what we wanted to hear, but I ended up taking Jean home, and we told her parents what was going on. Everyone was concerned. I mean, how did this guy find out where Jean had been adopted? How did he know where we were spending our time? Where the hell was he right now? All questions unanswered. A mutual friend, one of the cool kids, Lal, was having a party that weekend, and we were planning on going. It was going to be a beer party as the guy's parents weren't home, and everyone was kind of lying to their parents as to where they were going. You guys remember kid stuff, right? Gene and I got there, and there were people all over the place. Some playing cards and pool in the basement, others upstairs playing silly games like spin the bottle and whatever. I wasn't drinking because I was working on a baseball scholarship and didn't want any marks on my record. Gene was having some beer, and it was a fun night. As I said in the beginning, I get along with everyone. I remember we were standing in the kitchen with some friends when we heard all this shouting coming from the front of the house. The group of us went out there to see what was going on, and two of the guys from our football team were yelling and pushing someone out the front door. <laughs> Guess who? Fucking Bob. I broke away from Gene, yelled at the guys that he was a piece of shit stalking us, and about six of us ran out the front door and chased Bob up the street. He got away and jumped into a red Honda rice burner and took off. And we stopped running, and on the way back I told the guys what was going on. They'd been drinking, but what I thought was really cool was all of them saying that they had my back and would keep a lookout for Bob. The party went on without incident, and things were cool. Jean was obviously a little freaked out, but she didn't want to leave. I took her home after going to a restaurant to sober her up just a little bit so as to not let her parents know what had been going on. I kissed her goodnight and then went home myself. But Sunday morning, our phone rang and my dad answered it. It was still pretty early, but I could tell he was a little heated. My bedroom door popped open. He came in and said, Where were you last night? I knew bullshitting him at this point wasn't going to work, so I told him the whole story. When I told him I hadn't been drinking, he softened a bit, but told me I was still in trouble for lying about where Jean and I were, but we'd handle that later. The phone call was from Jean's parents. Bob had paid a visit to their house during the night and tried to break in. It was only by luck that Jean's mom had fallen asleep in their family room and heard someone trying to get in through a basement window. She went down to check it out and got a good look at Bob's face and was able to give that description to the cops. Again, that slippery shit got away. Later that day, though, the cops did find a car matching the description we gave them. It was parked at the edge of a Walmart in town and had what they claimed was something suspicious on the front seat, so they got in and searched it. What they found was some weed but more importantly, a DSLR with a full memory card full of pictures of Jean and me, but mostly of her. Everywhere. Jean going to school. Jean playing softball. Some were of her in her house taken through the windows. It was creepy. And there was more, though. There was a box of older pictures from when Jean lived with this asshat, and a notebook with all of these notes to Jean written inside. They said things like, I still have the necklace and you owe me, and... I haven't had your lips around my dick in a while. I think we should change that. Stuff like that. There was also a duffel bag in the trunk with handcuffs, duct tape, PVC pipe, zip ties, and another camera. It was really freaking creepy. We didn't see Bob for another week or so, but this last time would put an end to things. Gene's team was in our area's sectional playoffs at a local municipal stadium, and both of our families went to watch her play and a whole bunch of people from our school went too. In the third inning, I was talking to a buddy, one of the football guys I mentioned before, and he was telling a funny joke. It made me start choking on the water I was drinking because I was laughing so hard, and I got up to try to shake it off. I walked over to the edge of the stands and saw Bob. He was on the other side of the field, standing there and just staring. 
He didn't see me, and my choking stopped pretty quick. I went back to my friend and told him what was up, and he just said, fucking A. He told two more guys, and I told my dad who immediately dialed the cops and said for me to not get involved. <sighs> Sorry, Dad. No way. We jumped up, and my buddies went around behind the stadium while I ran around the outfield. I remember my dad calling my name and telling me to get back there, but I was determined to not let this asshat get away. By the time I got over to the other side of the field, my buddies had Bob making a run straight towards me. He had nowhere else to go, and I dove at his midsection and took him out and onto the ground. I'll admit, we did rough him up a little bit, but remember the cops were on their way and we didn't want to go too far. I'm not ashamed to say it though, I did blast him one in the balls. The cops showed up, everyone in the stands was wondering what the hell was going on, and they took this guy away as he had more weed on him and it was in individual baggies in his pockets so it looked like he was selling. I saw Jean watching from her dugout, and all I could do was give her a lame thumbs up to try to let her know that this guy was going out. When we got together after the game and all the statements were made to the cops, they overlooked Bob's claim that we had beat him up and I told her what had happened. She burst into tears, but I told her it was going to be okay. I had to go to court and make more statements, but didn't get more involved in things as it was mostly handled by Jean and her parents. Bob wasn't a minor, so he was being tried as an adult, and he got convicted of multiple things, including harassment, but the weed was his major downfall. He had a record, so there was no first-time offender slap on the wrist stuff. He admitted that he had been following Jean for a while, but then claimed that he was mentally ill and needed help. Yeah, right. Somehow, he convinced someone at the adoption agency to share Jean's information on some sob story about being her foster brother and didn't know where she was and really needed to talk to her, but I don't know much more about that. Jean and I stayed together for the rest of our high school days before breaking up when I went to college to play ball and she and her family moved to California. We're friends on Instagram and Facebook and PM each other every now and again. I'm sure Bob is out of jail now, or it's getting close to that time. I don't ever bring it up to Jean, but I hope he doesn't try to find her again. And though it's been ten years and we're no longer an item, I would still chase that guy down and give him another shot to the balls if I had to. The Wrong House, submitted by Jason. I've been a police officer for 15 years, the last five working as a detective. I live in a quiet suburban neighborhood, and most of my neighbors know what I do for a living, but to strangers, they'd have no idea who I really was. I wear plain clothes, and I have an unmarked vehicle. I'm married with two little girls. Hey, I hope yours is doing well, Uncle Josh. Forgive me if I'm cryptic about certain details in this, but sharing stories publicly like this might be frowned upon in my department, so I'm using assumed names for everything. My street runs about a half mile long and dead ends, but is bisected by another street. To the north, my backyard, is a little stream that splits the property behind my street. To the east is another street that leads to other neighborhoods north and south. That's the only street anyone can take to get to my block other than the little one that bisects things. But, because that one just leads to other blocks and has no outlet, there's rarely through traffic. Most of the houses are either modest two-story structures or ranches, and it's a quiet, nice place with a mix of older folks and people my age, mid-30s and 40s. We have a block club that also serves as a watch, but I stay out of that other than in an advisory capacity for obvious reasons. About two years ago, the block over from ours started to experience break-ins. After the third one in two weeks, people started to get a little nervous, and the block club started to meet to talk about what they could do to help the police, number one, stop the break-ins, and number two, send a message to any other would-be thieves. When asked, I told everyone the standard stuff. Keep your doors and windows locked, arm security systems if you have them, don't broadcast when the family was coming or going, and keep an eye on everyone else's homes and property. I stress to be wary but not paranoid, 
and make sure something really was off before calling the police. Just because you see someone you don't recognize walking through your neighborhood doesn't mean the police need to get involved. For a week or two, things seemed to quiet down, and it gave everyone a chance to talk about how the invaders were operating. The investigating officers felt it was the same person or persons, as entry was always the same. Cut glass in a downstairs window or door, and similar items were always taken. Small electronics and cash. No jewelry or big items like TVs. It was mostly gaming systems, laptops, and computers. Of course, pawn shops in the nearest city were checked routinely, but in this day and age, what's the point of a pawn shop when a thief can sell stuff online and get cash just as fast without any questions asked, right? Well, a house down the street from mine got hit, and everyone on the block went on red alert. This time, the guy broke in while the elderly woman was home and asleep. She woke up and caught him snooping around, and she yelled out. She had fallen asleep in her living room, and the guy didn't even need to break in. He walked right in through her unlocked patio door. He gave her a thump on the head, rolled her up in a blanket, and then tied her with a phone cord he ripped from the wall. No one found her until the next morning when her daughter came to take her to a doctor's appointment. I'm not going to lie. I was getting concerned, and I stopped by the village police department to talk to the chief about what was going on. I did not work for my hometown. I just want to note that. He assured me they were doing their best, and I believed it. But then the weird stuff started happening. More break-ins happened, some during the day, and people were reporting that not only were things being stolen, but women's clothing was being used for self-gratification acts, and worse, some pets were harmed. In one case, a woman two blocks over came home to find her panties soiled with semen and her little Pomeranian stuffed in a duffel bag that was then hung on a hook on a basement door. The dog was okay, but the owner obviously was not. In a worse case, there was no break-in at all, but someone the police were convinced was the same person had lured a little Bichon away from a back deck with some dog treats and then snapped a collar on it and tied it to a fence away from the house. A neighbor came out into his yard and saw the guy in the dark when he flicked the lighter, and that caught his attention. The neighbor yelled out and ran over and climbed the fence, but the guy ran away into the dark. He had dropped something next to the dog that the dog was sniffing. It was a can of lighter fluid. The dog had some of it on its hair, and, well, you can figure out what the guy was going to do. As I said... Everyone was on alert, and I set new curfews for my ten-year-old twins, and the new rule was they were not allowed to be outside unless under parental supervision. This became the norm around the blocks as well, and again, things seemed to quiet down for a bit. Then, one night in August, I was working late when my personal cell buzzed. It was my wife, and she told me that something odd was happening, and asked when I would be home. I asked her more about what she was worried about, and she said she thought there was someone outside. She was downstairs in the basement with my girls in our family room having pizza and movie night, and she heard someone walk by the glass block window behind her a couple of times. With everything that had been happening, she was obviously nervous. Not wanting her to panic, I told her to turn the home theater down and make sure the girls stayed quiet. I then asked her to use her cell to call my neighbor Stephen and have him come over. I was going to be leaving right then. I stayed on the line with her, but then I heard her voice drop and start to whisper that someone was walking around upstairs. I told her that I was almost home, and she said Stephen hadn't answered his other phone, and I told her to get the girls into our laundry room and shut the door and lock it and not to open it until I got there. I called the local police and told them what was going on and that I was going into my home when I got there and how I was dressed that evening. After parking across the street three houses up the block, I ran through the yards and noticed all of the houses were dark, including mine. I circled the house to the back and found the way the guy got in. He had cut the glass pane around the handle on the French doors that led out to our back deck. The door was still open, and I quietly went inside and pulled my pistol from my shoulder holster. 
Clearing the downstairs, I listened and heard a sound upstairs. Again, quietly moving up, pistol in front of me, I stopped and listened again. Someone was in our bedroom. I softly crept over and saw a man standing with his back to me, the streetlights pouring in on his front coming from the windows. His hands were in his pants. Freeze, police, put your hands on your head and get down on your knees. I said it calmly and coolly. None of that stuff you see on cops. He froze and didn't move for a minute, and I told him again to comply, and slowly he did. Keeping my pistol trained on him, I flipped on the lights and saw that his shorts were slipped down and his hand was full of a pair of my wife's panties. He had been touching himself with them while my kid's Nintendo switches and my wife's laptop sat on her bed in front of him. I told him to lie down on the floor. I pulled his hands behind him without touching them and put him in cuffs and kept a knee on his neck. I yelled out for my wife to open the front door, hoping she could hear me all the way in the basement, and thankfully she did. The police were just arriving and stormed upstairs and took over. I told them what I had seen and then went to get my girls. (laughs) They were all fine. My wife had simply forgot to turn on our alarm, and the guy got in by cutting the glass, and obviously nothing happened with the alarm. The police were sure he was the same guy that had been hitting all the houses around me, but that night he broke into the wrong house. I suppose this isn't as scary or messed up as the stories you usually get, but I assure you, a pervert breaking into your house when your wife and kids are home alone is plenty scary. I don't care how many things I've seen as a cop, I was really nervous that night. And to top it off, seeing him in the act of what he was doing was even more disturbing. Everyone, make sure your house is secure no matter where you live. Anything can happen anywhere, but a little preparation can keep you safe. Even though we caught this guy, everyone in my neighborhood is determined to remain vigilant, and I hope everyone out there does the same. Thing at Scout Camp, submitted by Flembottom. I grew up in scouting with my older brother, and my father was even our scoutmaster for a bit when one of the guys in charge found out he was really bad at it. I'd gone through Cub Scouts, Weeblows, and did make it to my Eagle, and my brother dropped out after a couple of years. It just wasn't his bag. There were a couple of summer camps in my area, and we would go out to those for events in the summers and winters. We always had a blast out there. I know a lot of people make fun of scouting, and believe me, yeah, there are problems that really do exist, but our troop was always above that shit. We had gay guys in our troop, and no one cared, and this was in the 90s, too, so really in the controversial time of what was going on. Anyway, there was this one trip that everyone wanted to do in the winter, and it was a weekend of outdoor stuff at a site a little off the beaten path. It was on a scout campground but it was at the far edge of it, and you really had to hike out there, or snowshoe for that matter. So, a bunch of guys in our patrol signed up for a weekend, and there were like three dads with the five of us, and we were going to go, so eight in total. We arrived at the campground Friday afternoon with just enough light to get out to the site, pitch tents, and gather wood for a fire and cooking. It was about three when we got out there, and everyone was bouncing around and excited to try this out. I guess we were around 13 and 16, so you know how kids are. None of us had ever camped outside in snow before. We'd always stayed in cabins and such. So we all had cold weather gear, and man, we needed it. It was cold that weekend, and while we were prepared, if you've ever camped in winter, it's still cold no matter how you slice it. After things were set up, we had to review the checklist of activities we had to do in order to complete the weekend and get credit for it. Working together, we got a ton of wood for a reflector fire, and some of the guys got stuff ready for dinner. As the sun fell, we were all in a great mood. The fire was going, food was getting prepped, and everyone was enjoying the camaraderie and fellowship of scouting. Two of my friends, I'll call them Jimmy and Chris, were in charge of building the latrine a little ways into the woods for privacy. They set things up so that when you had to go, no one would be able to see you doing your business. When they came back to our site, 
They had a weird look on their faces. Jimmy's dad noticed something was wrong and asked him if everything was okay, and they both nodded but didn't say anything. Later, after dinner, I saw Jimmy talking to his dad off to the side, and his father was kind of smirking. We both pulled cleanup duty, so when we were away from the patrol, I asked him what was up. He looked at me and said, Dad thinks it's nothing, but Chris and I saw something weird out in the forest. Don't laugh, but it looked like a really hairy guy. I blurted out, like Bigfoot? With a smile. And he just said, Dude, seriously, we're not kidding. It was weird. I asked him some more about it, and he just said that it was way back in the trees. And they couldn't see it perfectly, but I guess whatever it was just stared at them and then walked away. I didn't want to be a total dick, so I just said, maybe it was just some lost hiker, and I left it at that. Inside, I thought he was seeing things, but who knows, right? Back then, I didn't know much about Bigfoot in that area, but it's actually a pretty common thing I came to find out. There were lots of reports about it all over the state, and even a couple in the area that we were in. We finished up, sat around the fire and told some stories, and then wrapped it up for the night. In the middle of the night, I woke up because I heard some whispering coming from the tent next to me. It was Jimmy's dad talking to my dad. I heard the sound of a zipper and more whispering, and then I hear my dad say in a loud tone, Hey, who are you? What do you want? And then silence. If you're looking for trouble, you're going to get it, said Jimmy's dad, and then they went back to talking in low tones to one another. Of course, this woke everyone up, but they just said they saw a deer or something on the edge of the woods and wanted to scare it away. Now, I know we were just kids, but I'm sure all of us were thinking, why would you talk to a deer like that? Well, we all just went back to sleep. The next morning, we all got up for breakfast and the day's activities, and that's when Jimmy, Chris, and I followed our dads over to the woods as they were looking around for something. They saw it, and so did we. There were footprints in the snow, like human footprints, not wearing any boots. They turned to us and said to get going with our challenges for the day, and we did. But of course we immediately told the other guys what we had seen. Jimmy's dad started off on his snowshoes back to the main lodge, and I was assuming to say something to someone about a barefoot guy hanging around the outpost. We got immersed in the checklist of things we had to do, including making a fire with no matches and cooking a hot lunch, and pretty soon it was getting towards dark again. My other friend, I'll call Richie, went to go to the bathroom and came back running. I mean, his face was white as a sheet. He said there was a hairy man standing out in the woods, reddish-brown hair all over him, and it freaked him out really bad. The dads ran into the woods, and I heard my dad yell out, Hey! You! Get out of here! They came back, and once again, Jimmy's dad went to the lodge. He had called the camp director and the police and told them something strange was going on out there. They told us that we should leave if we felt threatened, but we didn't really know what to make of any of this, and honestly, as a kid, it was pretty exciting to think Bigfoot was real. So, we hunkered down later for an evening, and after talking about it a lot, Jimmy's dad told us to knock it off. It was probably just a local guy trying to have some fun with us. That's when we heard this strange cry. Kind of like an elk, but with a really deep voice, not a high-pitched one. It just kind of rose and dropped, and we all looked into the night sky wondering what it was. I've looked up those calls on YouTube, and like I said, it was a lot deeper, but it kind of came and went like those elk do. That's when I had to go to the bathroom. But there was no fucking way I was going into the woods after I heard that cry. So I just went to the edge of the firelight and took a pee. The cry came again, this time a lot louder. And all the dads looked at one another and didn't say anything. We wrapped things up again and did some cleanup as we would be leaving right after breakfast the next morning to get home to church. So, sleepily but still a little revved up, We went into our sleeping bags, whispering about what that sound was. At about 3 a.m., I heard footsteps in the snow around our camp area, 
and immediately figured it was one of the dads checking things out. I had to pee again. I guess too much hot chocolate. So I unzipped the tent and was just going to go around the edge of it to take my leak. I did, and when I looked at the edge of the woods, there it was. A little darker than the darkness of the trees. A massive, hairy-looking man. I stood frozen staring at it. It was huge. Had to be at least seven feet tall, and I knew right away this was not some local guy having fun with us. We kind of stared at each other for a minute, and then I heard footsteps behind me. Get the hell out of here, whoever you are. Just get out. Jimmy's dad was yelling at the thing. It just stood there for a minute, and then kind of faded back into the trees, crunching the branches and stuff on its way. Of course, everyone was now awake, and the dads pulled the plug. They told us all to get ready to hike. We'd come back and get the tents and stuff in the daylight. We did as we were told and made the walk back to the main lodge, crunching on the cold snow on our snowshoes. Every once in a while, since I was in the rear, I'd stop and listen, and I swear there was something in the woods just out of sight following us all the way back. Turns out, there was something out there walking after us as we went to the lodge. When the police showed up the next day, they found a trail of footprints in the trees, just out of eyesight. The next day, we went back for our gear, and that was the last I saw or ever heard of that thing. Some people might laugh at this story, but that really happened. Whatever it was, it didn't hurt us, but who knows what might have happened if it decided to get aggressive. I mean, it was huge. I was in scouts for a few more years after my eagle, and I spent a lot more time out at that campground. No one else I ever came in contact with had camped out there had had an experience like we did. Many years later, I searched around on the internet and found some reports that something like this was reported frequently, just about a half hour away from the campground. But, as far as I know, it never made an appearance at that camp again. I lived in Seattle for a few years when I was a teenager. My dad moved us to Seattle after his brother died in a car accident. My uncle left behind his widow, six kids, and his business that consisted of a tavern. His widow needed help running the business, so my dad agreed to go manage it for her. The tavern was a family-run business. My father managed it, and other family members worked it as bartenders, waiters, cleaning crew, etc. The tavern was open until 1.30 in the morning, seven days a week. My dad was there almost every night. The tavern was very popular in the Latino community, and on the weekends it had live music, so there was a cover charge to get in. One particular weekend, my dad decided to come home early. He was just so exhausted. He called it a night and came home around 11. Around 1 in the morning, I woke up for no apparent reason. Maybe two minutes later, the phone started ringing. This was a time before cell phones, so one of the two phones was always in my room. I remember sitting up and reaching for the phone that was on my nightstand when I told myself, I don't want to be the one told Ricky's dead. Ricky was my 23-year-old cousin that worked as security in the tavern. The phone rang for a while, and my parents never used to pick up the phone because 9 out of 10 times it was for me. My dad finally got tired of hearing it ring, so he went to the living room to answer. A few seconds later, I heard my dad yelling on the phone. He seemed very angry at someone, and I obviously couldn't hear the person on the other side, but I was thinking, Dad's angry because they killed Ricky, and he wasn't there to help him. I knew he had been shot in the back by a drunk customer, and I just knew that he was dead. Ricky had been called to the door because there was a customer that was upset he wasn't allowed in. Ricky explained to him that he had already had too much to drink and to come back another time. The guy did leave, but he came back an hour later with a gun and he shot my cousin four times in the back. I never told anyone that I knew Ricky was dead before my dad even picked up the phone. It's a very sensitive subject in my family and I certainly wouldn't bring it up now. I remember my aunt, Ricky's mom, 
was told that he died instantly, and somehow I knew that that wasn't true. I had a feeling that he knew what was happening and was really scared. I've kept this to myself for many years, and I've always wondered how and why I knew this. In another instance, when my mother lived in her house in Mexico, she was good friends with one of her neighbors. The neighbor was a single mom with twin daughters and one son. The kids were really nice and always ran errands for my mom and constantly checked up on her. I remember that over the years when I would visit my mother, which was almost every weekend, I would sometimes see those kids running around the neighborhood, and they would always greet us with a smile and wave. One weekend, before heading to my mom's house, I stopped at a local casino and was playing the slots, when I looked up and I saw the neighbor's son looking at me. So I smiled at him, and instead of smiling back, he quickly looked away. I thought it was weird because he was always so friendly. And then I thought, maybe he wasn't supposed to be there. I mean, the legal gambling age in Mexico is 18, and he looked like he wasn't a day older. After a few minutes, I looked up again, and this time he was sitting by a slot machine. I remember he was sitting sideways and spinning his little chair a little. I noticed he didn't seem to be playing, and I thought maybe he was waiting on someone. He seemed to be looking out into the rows of the machines. I forgot about him for a while, and when I remembered, I looked up, and he was gone. I just thought it was weird he didn't greet me, even though it seemed like he recognized me. That night, after a little bit of gambling, I headed over to my mom's house to spend the rest of the weekend. After talking to my mom for a while that night, she told me that she had gone to a funeral two days before. The neighbor's son had been killed. He was having lunch with friends, and two gunmen went into the restaurant and started shooting. The neighbor's son got shot in the head and died instantly. I told my mom that that was impossible. I had just seen him a few hours ago. It was not someone that looked like him. I mean, it was him. I was planning on telling my mom I saw him that night, but she beat me to it and told me that he had died the week before. I don't know why I saw him. I mean, we weren't close, and he also didn't seem to want me to relay any kind of message. He was just, well, just there. My last instance. About ten years ago, I was having a meeting with my supervisor, and she excused herself to take a personal phone call. She seemed to be arguing with someone and told the person that they could talk later. She apologized for the interruption and explained to me that her mom was giving her drama about feeling sick and had driven herself to the hospital. She said that her mom would often tell her that she was sick, but the doctors would always tell her it was just to get attention. It always turned out that she was fine. During the rest of our meeting, I could not get the feeling that her mom really wasn't okay out of my head. I told myself to stop because I said to myself, Look, her mom's going to die. I had never met her mom, but something told me that my supervisor was going to be sorry she didn't accompany her mom to the hospital that day. After our meeting, I went out to lunch, and when I got back, I was told that my supervisor had a family emergency, and she had to leave, and they didn't think she was coming back. That's when I knew for sure. I mean, I was 100% positive that her mom had passed away. As you've already guessed, her mom died that day in the hospital. It was shocking to her family because the lady was only 60 years old, and she was told she was very healthy. All the time she made drama over being sick, it was for unrelated symptoms, a headache, stomachache, back pain, etc. My supervisor took her mom's death especially hard because she felt guilty for not believing that she was sick and then letting her drive herself to the hospital. I knew her mom was not mad at her and didn't want her to feel guilty. Her mom felt bad that she had fought with her that last time they spoke. Of course, I never told her this because I have no way of knowing. I just do. Please don't think that I'm crazy or making any of this up. I know this story is really out there, and that's why I've never told anyone about this. But I am hoping that there are other people out there that have had something like this happen to them.
This is a story with a happy ending, I promise. It's a recount of some unsettling events I went through during my college years, as well as the most amazing example of the bro sixth sense I have ever witnessed. So, without further ado, meet Kevin. Kevin was a colleague of mine and was in the same group as me, which meant we had maybe five or six subjects per year together. Kevin was... odd. Not that there was anything wrong with him, physically. He was adorable. A bit nerdy, a bit on the shorter, scrawny side with blonde hair, big blue eyes, and like three fluffy hairs on his chin instead of facial hair. If I had to compare him to something, I'd say he looked like a cute, soft baby chicken. If baby chickens were mentally inclined to grow into serial killers. More on that later. At first, I didn't really notice him. There were a lot of people in my class. Everything was new, and I personally did not know anyone, except for a guy named Harper, whom I knew from my sports days, as we often competed against each other, exchanged colorful insults on the track, and then go get drinks together. Harper will be important later on. As I've said, I only knew Harper there, and there were only six other girls in my class, as I've attended classes that held little interest among the female college population. During that time, I made friends and got real chummy with three more geeky guys. Zachary, whom I even casually dated for a short time. Steve, whom we realized our mothers went to college together too, which equaled instant friendship. And Rick, with whom I shared many interests. So, to count it down, important guys so far. Harper, former sports competition adversary. Zachary, casually went out for a bit. Steve, chill guy, insta-friend. Rick, nerd to end all nerds, but a well of interesting trivia. <laughs> awesome guy. These are important. These would later become my personal army. And then, there was Kevin. Damn cute Kevin whom I made the mistake of asking if he had any notes picked up from the first half of a lecture I missed because I overslept. In Kevin speak, Hey, you got the notes from this morning? Apparently translated into, I have interest in you, oh magnificent Kevin. Nothing would make me happier than knowing I have caught your eye, so please, make sure I am never left without your presence again, for I cannot bear it. I borrowed his notes, partially copied them, and returned his notebook back. What I didn't see was that Kevin then sniffed the notebook when I had my back turned. Zachary noticed it first, and Snort laughed about it later, because my first reaction to it when he told me was to sniff myself and see if I stank or something. I was young and naive then, so the sniffing was less what's wrong with him and more what's wrong with me. And that's where it all went downhill. Over the next few weeks, Kevin would always be there, never talking to anyone precisely, just kind of staring at me when we were in class, when we had breaks and went out for coffee to the shop outside. Then he started showing up for classes we did not attend together and said he simply arrived too early for his later classes. He never participated. He just sat there in the back. Also, Kevin had sort of an aura about him. Like, you didn't have to look at the door to know when he entered the room. You just felt the eyes in the back of your head and kind of wished for a shower. Anyway, I didn't worry too much, until one day I went to the women's bathroom during a break. I did my business, went to the front section to wash my hands, and in came Kevin. I was alone. Kevin turned, closed the door behind him, and locked it. Needless to say, I was confused and unsure of what to do, so I just stared at him and asked if he needed something. Hi, he said, then proceeded with, How are you? Like he hadn't just locked himself in the women's bathroom with me for no fathomable reason. I realized something was very, very wrong and attempted not to panic, managing to keep a nonchalant expression and turn towards the mirror so I could still see him, and pretend to fix my makeup. Fine, I said, and spoke no more. I could see Kevin fidgeting, playing with the key nervously, and after a long and uncomfortable silence, an eternity really, I heard loud banging from the other side of the door. It was Harper and Steve. 
Harper yelled something like, Kevin, get your scrawny ass over here and open that door or I swear to God, in the next 10 seconds, the door ain't going to be the only thing I'm breaking. I could hear Steve behind him, sounding a bit panicked, telling him to move since he managed to get the spare key. Kevin paled and stepped away, the key he had falling somewhere to the floor. Steve and Harper unlocked the door, and Harper jumped on Kevin like a damn primate and knocked him to the floor, while Steve and Rick, who was there as well, got inside and all but dragged me out of the bathroom area. None of them wanted to tell me what or why or how any of that happened, but I pushed at the weakest link, Rick, when we were alone and found out that a whole hour prior to all of that, Rick overheard Kevin asking one of the on-campus students, you know, the guys who get some extra cash if they help with paperwork, fixing and cleaning the campus, for the lady's bathroom key and paying him for it. Rick didn't know why the hell Kevin would need that key, but knew that Kevin was a weirdo, so he figured it couldn't be good. Later on, Steve was looking for me and asked Rick if he had seen me, and stuff kind of clicked for Rick. They asked around, and people told them they saw me go to the bathroom area, and I didn't come out yet. Moore confirmed that they saw Kevin going there, too, and joked that we must have had a makeout session. Steve immediately connected the dots. Harper overheard him talking to Rick, and they went to break me free from Kevin's affections, while Steve ran to get the extra key from the janitor. Kevin appeared with a lightly black eye in class two days later, just wishing to forget the whole thing. I pretended he did not exist. I wish this was the end of it. Maybe a week or two went by. I figured he learned his lesson. He's leaving me alone. But then he got the wind in his sails back for some reason and proceeded with attempting to sit next to me in class. He was so insistent that Zachary got involved and now the guys, Harper, Zachary, Steve, and Rick, made a timetable so two and two would attend classes at all times when I was there so each could sit on either side of me. I never asked any of this of them. They insisted. After a few failed attempts, Kevin gave up and settled for sitting in the back, glaring at my back and the other two guys on duty that day. I wish this was the end of it. Two weeks later, Kevin didn't show up for class or left early. I hoped he'd found some other interests and that it was finally over. Hell no. I noticed Kevin was now following me to the bus station. It took just one time to see him standing inconspicuously behind the newspaper stand to freak out and call Steve as he lived nearby. Steve picked me up and drove me home. The next morning, Harper called me around 9 and went, Are you in my class at 10 today? Um, yeah. All right, pack your shit and wait for me at the end of your street. Kevin is waiting for you at the bus station. Steve just called me. This went on for some five days as the guys extended their bro services to now accompanying me literally at all times, before, during, and after class. Just to point out yet again, I'm eternally grateful for it. These four dude bros of mine were like the four horsemen of the apocalypse. All business and vengeance, and it was amazing, and probably saved me from a lot more problems with cute Kevin. That day, Kevin showed up to class looking somewhat roughed up, but now stared at me with so much hate I could barely cope, and finally, after some sound advice from Harper and Rick, decided to bring this shit to college authorities. The pro dean immediately transferred Kevin to a completely different group, so our classes never overlapped again. I stopped seeing Kevin all the time and reached my final year in college. By now, Zachary and Steve moved away. Harper finished it early and no longer attended classes, so it was only me and Rick now. But it was okay since Kevin was no longer there. I wish this was the end of it. Rick and I finished college, graduated, and decided to celebrate by visiting a medieval fair in Rick's hometown that summer. We agreed to get some drinks for old time's sake. All was well. We had a great time as we toured the fair a bit. And suddenly, Rick... The sweet, polite Rick goes, Son of a bitch, ain't that fucking Kevin? Twas fucking Kevin. Goddamn cute Kevin is there, staring at us, then turns on his heel and leaves. 
We saw him a few more times. I started to panic, thinking he was following me again. So Rick was already dialing a few of his friends to come over. But Kevin suddenly got lost, and I never, ever saw him again. Carry on, Kevin, you creepy little chicken. Hope you learn to function in society by now. Easter Egg Hunt, submitted by El Grappo. When I was a kid, our church always held an Easter egg hunt the Saturday before Easter. It was for little kids, really, but some of the older kids showed up to get in on the fun, and we had a fun time knocking into each other and pushing and shoving until the parents told us to knock it off. Such was the case one egg hunt when I got into a fight with this older kid named Darby. He wasn't a total bully, but he did tease a lot of the smaller guys. I was nine at the time, so he must have been around twelve. Anyway, we're running around looking for eggs, and I see one way off the church lawn by the edge of some trees that were between the church and a creek. I didn't say anything out loud, and no one else seemed to be noticing it, so I thought I'd leave it as a best-of-last kind of thing, and then to use it to gloat over everyone else. I kept at it with my friends, but stopped for a second when I noticed this guy standing at the edge of the parking lot with a camera. I didn't recognize him. He wasn't a member of our church. I figured maybe he was someone's father or stepfather or whatever and blew it off. For the next few minutes, I got this weird feeling, though. I'd stop hunting around for eggs and start looking for that guy. Every time I saw him, he was gesturing towards the creek to some kid or one of my friends, and they were basically ignoring him. Just as things were about to wrap up, I saw him kneeling next to Darby and pointing towards the creek. Darby nodded, and then the guy went over to a little girl who didn't want him around, obviously. That came out pretty fast as she started crying really loud, and he grabbed her by the arm. Someone yelled out, and the guy ran across the parking lot and disappeared into the trees on that side of the church, with a few of the dads in hot pursuit. During all the commotion, I remembered my egg down by the trees near the other crook of the creek, and I started going for it. Out of the corner of my eye, I saw Darby going for it, too, and knew I'd really have to book it if I was going to get there before him. Either he saw it on his own, or the guy told him. It turns out, it was the latter. So, we're both tearing after this stupid egg, and I had a little lead on him, and he knew it. Right as I'm going to get to it, Darby jumped through the air and tackled me. We slid toward the tree and the egg, and I slapped at it with my hand as I couldn't really grab it. Darby tried to get up, but I kicked him in the knee, and now we're just wrestling around on the ground. But after a few minutes... I realized we're actually really kind of fighting, and our dads ran over to yank us away from each other and back on our feet. Darby's dad asks what the heck we're doing, and he says something about the egg. My dad picked it up and looked puzzled. He showed it to Darby's dad, and they both frowned. It wasn't the same kind of egg as the others we'd been finding, and you could tell there was something sloshing around inside it. Our dads made me and Darby shake hands, and we all went back over to the church. We hung out with the other kids eating hot dogs and the candy that was in our other eggs, and a bunch of dads went over to the van garage. They came back, and a police car was pulling up, and that group had a big discussion before we all went home. Despite me badgering my dad all the way home, he didn't say what was in the egg. Darby's family moved about a year later, and it wasn't until I was like 16 that my dad finally told me what was going on that day. The egg was a thicker plastic than the real Easter eggs that we were using for the hunt, and that's why they knew something was wrong. Inside the egg? After the police took it, they reported back it was hydrofluoric acid. They put it together that the creeper who had been hanging around on the fringes of the event and pointing at the egg had put it there and was waiting for a kid to find it and open it. That's messed up beyond the beyond, if you ask me. They never caught the guy, and to this day no one knows who he was, and he was never seen around our town again. Thank you. 
The Trapper, submitted by Karen A. I recently remembered a story my mother told me when I was growing up. I discounted it as a tall tale, but I've always been a fan of urban myths and was surprised to realize I haven't come across this story anywhere else. Here's how it went, as I recall. This took place about a hundred years ago on the Dakota Plains. It was in March, when the days were getting longer and the worst of winter had ended. Animals were coming out each day to check the approach of spring, leaving tracks in the snow leading back to their lairs. It was a good time to hunt and trap. So early one morning, a friend of my grandparents set out to do just that. His plan was to spend the day setting up muskrat traps in nearby ponds and creeks. Around midday, clouds rolled in suddenly the air filled with snow, and the wind began to howl, and the trapper found himself lost in a blizzard. Now, this man was no fool. He knew he faced a very dangerous situation. Whiteout conditions meant the man could see mere inches in front of his face, and the temperatures were dropping fast, and with the wind chill, it would be difficult to survive the night ahead. Shelter. He needed to find shelter. The last trap he'd set was in a muskrat lodge along a creek not too far back, so he turned around and attempted to retrace his steps, moving quickly and saying his prayers that God would help him find his way. Whether it was truly the grace of God or mere good fortune, he soon made out tall, shadowy figures a few steps in front of him. A grove of trees. Good. That meant he'd found the creek. The man carefully made his way about halfway down the steep incline toward the creek, and then started moving sideways along the embankment. Within a few steps, his way was blocked by a tree lying on its side, uprooted from the grove during a spring flood many seasons ago. He crawled back up the embankment along the tree until he found where the roots had pulled the tree from the earth. The snow in this hollow was loose and relatively easy to dig out, the space would be his shelter for the night. He set down his pack and ventured back out into the storm, now following the tree down toward the creek bed. Cattails and rushes poked out above the snow along the bank, and with freezing fingers he gingerly broke off one stalk and then another. Although too wet to burn, these could be woven together and laid down inside the shelter to protect his body from the frozen ground overnight. The whiteout conditions made it difficult to track the passage of time. It could have been minutes or hours as the man gathered reeds with meticulous precision. He never took more than a few steps away from the fallen tree, and he only broke off the reeds directly in front of him before turning back around and returning to the tree. If he got off by even a few degrees, he could easily walk past the tree and wander away from his shelter, and that was a risk he could not take. He repeated this process several times, and eventually it grew darker and colder, and the man decided that more reeds was not worth taking the risk. He then made his way back to his shelter and started weaving and arranging the reeds. He was fairly confident that this shelter was enough to survive the night, but this blizzard could last anywhere from 10 hours to 10 days. His future was still very uncertain. After a while, the man noticed a subtle change to the sound of the howling wind. He listened carefully and came to realize that he heard the faint sound of a bleeding sheep. And if he wasn't mistaken, the scent of smoke was drifting along with the snow. Could there be other people nearby? He considered his options. If someone was nearby with a fire and domesticated animals, then unlike him, that someone was in a much better position to withstand a long blizzard. Yet he knew there were no farms nearby. Could it be a peddler traveling through, or new settlers? Maybe it was Indians. Although the trapper had met many friendly Indians in the area, they did not keep sheep. Plains Indians were nomadic, and domesticated animals moved too slowly to keep up with them on their travels. On the other hand, hostile Indians might steal such animals during a raid on nearby white settlers. Trapper did not want to walk into a camp of Indian raiders. After some thought, the man picked up some of the rushes and started weaving them together in a long, thick cord. 
He worked diligently for several hours until he had crafted a long rope. He tied one to the roots of his tree and the other to his waist, and then he started to climb up the embankment. His plan was to travel the length of the rope and see what he encountered. If he couldn't see anything before he ran out of rope, he would return to his shelter. But if he did see a campfire, he would watch from the cover of darkness and determine who was there before proceeding. Each step the man took was deliberate and cautious. He wasn't worried about being heard above the howling winds of the storm, but the embankment was steep and his rope was not strong. If he fell, he could break his rope and lose his way. Even worse, he could injure himself in the fall. So he had to be patient and not let his eagerness overtake his common sense. Finally, he reached the top of the embankment. Though the wind was still howling, the snow flurries were weaker within the shelter of the tree grove. And there, not too far away, he could see a large fire through the falling snow. A bleeding sheep was tied to a nearby tree. Two other figures were also visible in the light of the fire. The two creatures were clearly bipedal, but it was equally clear that they were not human. They were covered in fur and extremely tall. Both had elongated jaws full of sharp, snapping teeth, and the trapper suddenly realized that the howling he'd been hearing was not all from the wind. These two monstrous creatures were fighting over the small, terrified sheep. The trapper quickly turned around and retraced his path back down the embankment, and although he made it back safely, he no longer felt safe. He was trapped there, with hungry monsters fighting less than fifty feet above him. The rest of the night he lay huddled in his shelter, shaking with cold and fearful that a monster would come down the embankment. Hours later, the wind eventually lulled him into an uneasy slumber. When he next awoke, the air was still, and the early light of dawn revealed a cloudless sky. The storm was over. The man lay quietly and listened. He heard no howls or animal cries, and there were no wafting smells of a campfire. Eventually, he rose from his shelter and made his way up the embankment. Snowdrifts covered most of the clearing in the tree grove, but a thinner layer of snow covered the area where a fire had once been. There were uneven patches in the snow where huge feet or paws had stepped. The end of a rope was visible and was tied to a tree. The man tugged on it, and a frayed end came loose from the snowdrift. No sheep, no monsters, no evidence of what had happened here the night before. The man didn't linger. He quickly set off back towards his home, pausing here and there to retrieve the traps he'd set just the day before. He didn't plan on returning to this area ever again. That was the end of the story that my mother told me. She swore it was true that she overheard a trusted family friend telling it to her parents in confidence, and he was not the type of man to lie or indulge in flights of fancy. Still, I figured this was just a clever tale to discourage children from playing outside or wandering off. (laughs) Given the impact it had on my mother, it did that very well. Creepy Classmate by El Alpaca Loco What you guys need to know, I'm a very, very touchy-feely, sweet type of person, and I would always hold hands with my friends, lay my head on their shoulders, and would give them warm hugs. There's no malice whatsoever, because that's how affectionate I am. This happened during the first major school contest, a school play, during our sophomore year in high school. I was assigned as the head of the props committee, and I was given the liberty to choose classmates I wanted to be in the props committee, too. Of course, I chose creepy classmate Stalker, who I'll refer to as C.S., and my friend and savior I'll refer to as L. I chose them to be in the props because I know guys like them wouldn't want to be part of the play. Like I said, I'm a very sweet and affectionate person, and I felt pity that not many of my classmates were talking to C.S. because he was the odd one out the class outcast, and it was only L who was talking to him, because they were seatmates, but that was it. So I approached him and befriended him to make him feel less lonely. You know, what a good person would do. And along the span of making props, C.S. and I got close. The worst thing to have happened, sadly. 
One day when classes were done, I stayed a bit later than usual because I was making sure our rival section wasn't going to sabotage our props. Typical high school rivalry. What do you expect? It was already six in the evening when I left the building and was walking to the bus stop. I felt someone walking behind me, so I turned around, and along the crowds of college students, there was C.S. leaning on a pole while looking at his phone. This caught me off guard because he usually leaves campus on the east gate, not the main gate where I always go. I just let it slide and thought maybe he was waiting for L or was just hanging around. We have this open area in the campus which is like a park before you reach the main gate. The next day during lunch, I guess I left my bag unzipped because when I got back from the cafeteria, there was a brown paper bag inside which I know I didn't bring. Picking it up, there was a Hershey's chocolate bar inside it and a small note taped on it that says, You look so pretty today, alpaca. I really didn't mind the letter because the only thing in my mind is that I got a chocolate bar. Nonetheless, I showed the note to my best friend and Elle, and both of them had different reactions. My best friend, being the hopeless romantic she is, was way beyond happy that I had a secret admirer. Elle, on the other hand, was, for lack of a better word, irked. It happened again the next day, the next week, next two weeks, with the messages becoming longer. Your smile is so cute, and you're so beautiful. You have a cute laugh, and I really like you, that kind of stuff. One day, for some reason, the faculty had an emergency meeting, so that meant an hour without class, and we were talking, some had their phones out, and my seatmate was sleeping. I was busy doing calligraphy on my journal, when I saw a flash of light in my peripheral vision. I looked in the direction where it came from, and I saw C.S. fiddling at his phone or tablet, which was undoubtedly angled at me. Again, I let this slide. That's when L walked by and slipped a paper onto my lap saying, look at your phone. So I took my phone from my bag, turned it on, and L sent a message. I have something to tell you later. Be online. That night at home, I was waiting for L to go online, and when he was, his first message was to avoid CS and stop talking to him. I asked why, and he sent pictures of a phone, a gallery to be exact, and I noticed one album with the title, Alpaca. The next photo L sent was the contents of the album. It was pictures of me. Pictures from my Facebook, pictures during class, stolen pictures, and some pictures were obviously zoomed in, or cropped, so that it was only my face in the picture. <laughs> obviously, I got creeped out, and asked L whose phone was that? And lo and behold, it was from CS's phone. L further then told me that the paper bag with the Hershey's and messages were from CS. He knew from the start because of the handwriting, and I got creeped out even more. L told me to be safe and to start avoiding CS from now on, and I did. The next few days, I gave the paper bag to L without getting the Hershey's, and I think CS was slowly noticing that I was avoiding him. And this is where the shit hits the fan. Another day of me leaving school at 6 p.m. because of a school seminar, as usual, I was walking to the main gate when I noticed there weren't many students out for some reason, which made the walkway less crowded. The next thing I knew, I felt someone behind me, and there was C.S., failing to hide behind a big bush. My red flag was waving, so I called L. and told him that C.S. is behind me and hiding behind a bush. L frantically told me to walk fast towards the bus stop and stay on the line with him. I tried my best to calm my nerves and walk fast, and I would simply look over my shoulder, and I could see C.S. keeping up and almost a hundred feet near me. I think L. picked it up now, and how I gasped and he told me to run. I ran towards the main gate and to the overpass and hid behind a stall selling street food on the sidewalk. A few minutes later, I saw C.S. by the bus stop, looking around, and was low-key, checking if the students by the bus stop, wearing our school uniform, was me. I was still on the call with L, and I told him C.S. was looking for me by the bus stop. Fortunately, C.S. left and went back to the overpass, but L. told me I should go to the bus stop on the next block, just to make sure. And I did get home safely. The following weeks consisted of me avoiding C.S. like the plague. 
but I felt his stare on the back of my head whenever I looked around the classroom and got a glimpse of him. He would have this straight stare, and it really freaked me out. L was kind enough to accompany me by the bus stop, and sometimes he would distract CS whenever classes were dismissed. The final straw was when CS shoved an envelope inside my bag, and it was three yellow pad papers. I didn't get to read it because L took it from me, and he read it instead. After reading it, he tore the papers up and threw it out. I asked him what the letter was about, and he told me CS thought I loved him because I befriended him and that we were in a relationship and was confused that I was avoiding him. He went on and on that he loved me and that we were the perfect couple. I was dumbfounded. I backtracked to how I befriended him and how I approached him, and I wondered if I let him on, but I know I didn't. I was just being myself. Push came to shove, and I told CS that I didn't love him, nor were we ever in a relationship. The rest of the school year went smooth, except for the time CS and I were in a group for a project or activity, but I always made sure to keep the conversation short and quick. So, dear creepy classmate, let's not meet again. Even at reunions. Little Town Terror, submitted by Chickenfoot Fan. My grandfather and father told me this story about something that happened back in the early 80s. I'm going to retell it the best that I can and share it the way he told it to us. My dad was 10 at the time it happened, and he's been filling me in on the details when I ask him about it. I've been messing around with this tale since I heard your other stories about police and firefighters. I hope it's good enough for your listeners. My family hails from a town in the middle of nowhere, Kentucky. I mean that. It's a gas stop on the way someplace else. I'm not using the names of any real places or people, and I think everyone understands why with stories like this. The closest city to this town was about 40 miles away, and while there are state police, this little town did have two town marshals, my grandfather being one of them. Now, there may be about 700 people living there now, but back then it was closer to 1,000, as a big company had just been installed not too far away. It was a big factory, and that was why more people were around. My grandfather's place was just outside of town, and it was a modest home where he lived with my dad, aunt, and grandma. It was just a ranch with a pole barn behind it where he had a woodworking and metal fabrication side business. And as he says, if he wasn't doing his job keeping the peace, he was building or fixing pieces of stuff for everyone in town. I should say this outright. My grandfather was a very well-liked man. It's not like police today. My grandfather grew up in the same town, and so did my grandmother. He was truly a peacekeeper that everyone loved to have around at family get-togethers and church functions. My dad told me he only pulled his gun twice in his long career, and one of the times was what I'm going to tell you about with this story. After going to Vietnam, my grandfather came back home and married my grandma. She was a teacher, and he got his job with the police department. Outside of a judge for the courts, it was really like Mayberry, one other deputy and a one-cell jail in a town building. For serious offenses, bad guys got shipped to the county jail, and they became someone else's problem. My grandfather built his place on the edge of a town near a creek, and not long after came my aunt and dad. The biggest things that would happen would be property disputes or the town drunks getting into trouble. There were more churches than taverns and restaurants there, and it was mostly farm country. Like I said, the trouble started when my dad was ten. He'd just gotten home from school, and my aunt, who was a few years older, was still at her school that was much farther away. My dad remembers this part as my aunt was really upset and rushed my dad inside. Then she got on the phone to call my grandfather, frantic. Unfortunately, she got someone else and was just terrified that someone was outside the house and she didn't want him around. They radioed my grandfather and she said, I just need to speak to him. There's a man outside and he was asking questions and wanting to come in the house. So she hung up the phone and then smiled at my brother. She told him to get himself a snack and to watch cartoons despite his wanting to go outside. This was odd. He normally had free reign of the yard. It was springtime, and he wanted to meet his friends out in the woods or whatever, but my grandmother wouldn't let him go. 
Not long after that, my grandfather pulled up and came into the house. Dad said my grandmother practically jumped on him and started talking about a man who came to the house looking for odd jobs and was acting strangely. My grandfather said it was probably just a guy from the town over that she hadn't seen and was just trying his luck looking for some work. Now, I love my grandfather, but my dad said that even at 10, he wondered why a guy would be looking for work like that when the new factory had just gone in and they were practically begging people to work. My grandmother said she didn't care what my grandfather thought, but she needed him to come by the house and check things out. She said that the guy was making like he was going back up the road away from the house, but then saw him go over to the trees and start walking back towards the house. My grandfather said to calm down that he would have a look around and then told my father to go out with him. He said they were going for a walk. Grandma went nuts and said he wasn't going anywhere because the guy could be dangerous, but my grandfather said there was nothing to it and I think he was using my brother to make her feel a little bit better. He used to always use the term, he looks cooped up when it was such a nice day and my grandmother wanted him to stay inside. So, off they went. But I guess my grandmother kept yapping at both of them to be safe and all the stuff a mom says when she's nervous. When they went out and looked around, there wasn't a trace of anyone in the trees, behind the barn or down to the creek. There was just no one out there. The house was at the end of a dead-end road, with only one other neighbor at the foot of the crossroad, so the two of them went down there to ask if they saw anything out of place. The older couple who lived there hadn't seen or heard anyone all day and couldn't really help. So they went back to the house, tried to calm my grandmother down, but she was still thinking something was wrong. Two nights later, my grandfather was at a lodge meeting and grandma was home while my dad and aunt were at a church group. It was around 8.30 and dark outside when she looked up from the kitchen sink out the window and there was a guy in a black ski mask standing right there looking in at her. She screamed and the guy ran off into the back, and then she frantically called the lodge to get a hold of my grandfather. He came flying home with some of his lodge friends, and they searched the area, but again, they couldn't find any proof of a guy being out there. And Grandma was near hysterical, and shouting, He'll be back! He'll wait till you're gone, and he'll be back! My dad and aunt got home and things calmed down a little, and no one said anything to them. The night just went on normally. That is, until the phone woke up my grandfather and he had to run out on a call for a car accident or something. Grandma tried to stay up as she wanted to protect the house, but she ended up falling asleep in the living room waiting. Sometime around three, Grandma woke up to a noise in the kitchen and her blood froze. But then she thought quickly maybe it was my dad or my grandfather. So she got up and walked into the room and flipped down the lights. The refrigerator door was open, and there was a bunch of food stuff on the table, and the back door slammed shut just as she walked in. Grandma ran to the window and saw a dark figure running away from the house. Totally wigged out, she got even more scared knowing that she had locked the door when my grandfather had left. She waited until he came home holding onto a rolling pin and a broom as if that was going to help anything. When my grandfather got there, she went off and he had to calm her down again, and he looked around. He checked the locks on the doors, but nothing was wrong with them. Now even he was getting unnerved about the whole thing. I mean, how was this person getting in? Then my grandmother noticed something else. My aunt's yearbook was missing from the countertop, and she had brought it home the day before. Later that day, they asked her and my dad about it, and neither of them knew where the book went. They searched both their rooms and the entire house, but the book was gone. My grandfather called an investigative unit out to check for fingerprints later that morning, but there were none unfamiliar to the family. He couldn't figure out who the heck this was. For two days, nothing out of the ordinary happened, but my grandma did drive my brother and sister to and from school and then had two friends stay with her throughout the day. My grandfather was not letting any of this stuff go and wandered out to his workshop to think and also craft some braces for the doors and windows one day after work. He wasn't going off the deep end. He was just a little wary. A little while later, my dad walked into the shop and had something to say, or rather show. He was really worked up and said he found something out back in the woods. 
My dad led my grandfather out there, and what they came upon was really creepy. There was a fire pit that had recently been used, and the bodies of three or four chickens that had their throats slashed. Blood was on some of the trees, but mostly on some sticks on the ground. When my grandfather stepped back, he saw that the fire pit was actually in the center of a pentagram. He looked at my dad, grabbed him by the hand, and said they needed to leave, and took him straight back home. My grandfather called the judge and then the investigative unit again. Another team of men came out from the state and took photographs of everything in the woods, but they found something else. A picture of my Aunt Mary from the missing yearbook. It was mixed in with the blood and sticks on the ground forming the pentagram. My grandfather didn't say anything about that to my grandma. Things were getting out of hand, but he didn't want to wig her out more than she already was. He was also stubborn. When he was advised to get out of town for a while, he refused. He felt it was his town and his house to protect, and not just his family's. He wanted to watch over everything. That night, he had a dinner at the lodge that originally was just going to be him and my grandma, but he took everyone to celebrate, or so they thought. Actually, he wanted everyone to be near him and not back at the house alone. When they got home that night, right away he noticed that something was wrong. The front door was open, and that certainly wasn't right. He radioed his deputy, and then went back to the town building and told my mom and aunt and grandma to wait there for him, and he left them there, as he and his deputy went back to the house, and slowly entered it. The whole of downstairs was fine and clear. No one was there, and it didn't look like anything had been taken. They went upstairs, and again, nothing valuable was gone. They went back downstairs and noticed that they had missed something big. Blood was smeared on a bunch of family photos, but just streaks of blood on my aunt. Then they both noticed the bloody pentagram on the back of a door they had walked through and not noticed. That was it for my grandfather. He took everyone to the next town over that had a motel, and they all stayed there that night with my dad asking a million questions. My grandfather didn't share anything, but when the kids had finally gone to sleep, my grandfather told my grandma what was going on, and that he wanted her to take my dad and Mary to her sister's in Nashville, which was about an hour and a half away. The next morning, they went back to the house to get some things for the trip, when the phone rang for Mary. It was her friend Sue, and she asked if she could stay over at her house if it made her feel better, and my grandparents said if it would make her feel better, that was fine. It was, of course, anywhere but being at that house. My grandfather strictly forbid anyone being there. So, Grandma headed south with my dad, and Mary went to her friends, and my grandfather was trying to piece together what the heck was going on at his house and in his town. He went to the town building and stayed there working things through, and was also waiting to see if someone would go back to his house later. He went out twice during the day and once in the evening. No one strange had been out there, and he couldn't see any trace of anyone being on the grounds. However, someone familiar would be stopping out later that evening. Mary. My aunt had decided she needed something from her dresser, and she and Sue snuck back to the house just before dusk to get it. They went inside and headed up to Mary's room, where they got the shock of their lives. In her room were two men with ski masks on, who quickly jumped them and had them bound and gagged pretty fast. They left the girls tied up on the floor and then went through the house looking for stuff to steal. At least that's what my grandfather assumed. My dad told me that my aunt had said they came back in with stuff in pillowcases and then put pillowcases over their heads and dragged them out of the house. The girls said they were carried for quite a while and tried to scream for help, but out in the woods no one could hear them. The men put them down, tied Sue to a tree by her back, but kept Aunt Mary and kept walking. When they didn't show up back at Sue's that night, all hell broke loose in town as my grandfather rousted everyone he knew to help find the girls. There were guys on motorcycles, guys combing the woods, guys looking into buildings and cars. You name it, they did it. A search party found Sue later that morning, 
and while she was badly shook up, she was okay. She had no idea what happened to Mary, but a state trooper did have an idea not long after Sue was found. There was an area used for camping at a pond not too far out of town. As part of their search, everyone was checking any possible place people might be, and what struck this trooper as odd was there was a big Chevy Impala that came by him into town, went straight to get gas, turned around, and then started to head back out of town the same way he came in. But suddenly, the driver changed his mind when he saw the trooper, turned around again, and then went toward the campground. The trooper thought this was odd behavior, especially with what was going on, and he followed the car and finally stopped the Impala, and then went over to run the license and registration as part of a routine stop and check. The driver's information came back clean, but the trooper thought he was acting fidgety, especially when he was questioned about what he was doing out there and where he was headed. The driver kept saying over and over that he had just gotten a job at the new factory, but he still didn't have a permanent address, and he didn't have a lot of belongings in his car. He also couldn't recall the name of a hotel he said he was staying at. None of it added up. Then, the trooper heard a thump coming from the trunk. He played it cool and told the driver to hang tight. He didn't want to keep him there any longer, but there was the search going on, and he had to be thorough. The driver nervously nodded as if he understood. The trooper went back to his car, radioed my grandfather and his superiors, and said that he thought someone involved in the kidnapping was out there. My grandfather made it out there before anyone else, and the two talked about what was going on. Suddenly, the driver of the car hopped out and made a run for it, and one of the only two times my grandfather ever pulled his gun was this time, and he shot it twice, missing the man, but it scared the guy enough that he stopped running. Just then, other squad cars pulled up, and everyone swarmed the Impala, and lo and behold, inside the trunk was the other guy holding my aunt, who was still tied up. Both of the men obviously were arrested and were charged with a lot of things, including kidnapping. They were two drifters who recently got jobs at the new factory, but they were also spending a lot of their time getting really high on all kinds of drugs and who knows what else they were up to. Somehow, they had convinced each other to make a pact with the devil so they can change their lives, but they had to kill an innocent local, and somehow that would make them transcend, as my grandfather always said. He never figured out what that meant, but apparently upon questioning, they kept saying they were trying to transcend. Miraculously, my aunt made a full recovery. The funny thing is, the family didn't leave town. They stayed. I mean, the two guys never made it clear why they picked my grandfather's family to stalk. It seemed completely random. But my grandfather doesn't believe that. To this day, he is positive they singled out his family for a reason. The two guys did admit that they had followed Mary around quite a bit after noticing her in town, and that was all before they made their final move in preparation, which was supposed to originally happen in the woods behind her house. Like I said, my aunt came out of this on top. She did move away and raised a great family, and I love her and my cousins dearly. My grandfather is a great guy, and I'm so glad everything worked out in a story like this. Anyway, that's my scary cop story. I hope you use it for a compilation or something. I've never been to that little town myself, and even though this happened years and years ago, I think I'm going to avoid it. My story is a long one, so I'm putting all these shorter ones together. The first happened a few years back. My younger sister and I were sitting on our back patio listening to music and relaxing, while my parents were at the other end of the house in the garage. In the middle of our house is a long hallway with the laundry room. I should add now, I personally believe each encounter I'm about to share has something to do with my grandfather who passed away five years ago. While outside, I would make frequent trips into the house to grab something to drink or snack on, and I never saw my parents come inside the house, or anywhere near the laundry room. It was around 10 at night, and we came inside to get ready for bed. 
and I made a trip into the laundry room to grab my clothes that had finished drying. Pooled on top of the washing machine, dripping down the front of it, was blue soap. I thought nothing of it, just that the soap container had fallen and spilled. Except then I noticed the position in which the container was sitting. Upright, on top of the laundry machine, next to the spot the soap was pooling. I picked up the container and went to set it back on the wooden shelf where it stays and noticed there was soap on the shelf as well. It looked as though someone had intentionally grabbed the soap container, poured it onto the shelf, and then on top of the washing machine, then set the container down standing upright on top of the machine. The next thing happened almost a year ago, on my 19th birthday. The night before the official day was a full moon and my sun sign Sagittarius. I'd wanted to spend it outside under the moonlight, and while doing so, I couldn't help but think about my grandfather and the experience my Aunt Amanda said she had regarding his ghost. I'm not going to try and recite her story word for word because it isn't mine, and I didn't see it for myself, but she did mention my grandfather going outside and pointing at the sky after having looked into the telescope we kept close to the back door. After some reflection on her story, I chanced to look up at the sky, and at that moment saw a shooting star. Nothing paranormal, granted, and this story might not have any paranormal elements at all, but I'll leave that up for you to decide. Personally, I have no explanation for why that happened. After the shooting star, I began to make my way inside as it was around midnight. Just then, I began to hear what sounded like cheerful fair music. And this is the bit I can't explain. I live in the countryside. My home is completely surrounded by thick forest, and the direction in which the sound was coming from was a particularly dense portion of forest, the only thing on the other side being the home of an old farmer. I walked closer to the sound, but it didn't fade away or get louder. It went on for about three minutes, and then stopped abruptly. I should add my birthday is considerably close to Christmas, which could potentially explain the cheerful music, but it doesn't explain the odd time and placing. My final experience I have to share so far is something that happened about a month ago. It was around 8 in the evening, and I was sitting on my couch reading while the TV played in the background. The remote was sitting next to me on the other cushion, not being touched, and suddenly the TV went black as it changed channels. I looked at the remote, which was still untouched on the cushion next to me, and in plain sight. I watched as the TV switched to a channel that plays music, and thought maybe one of my family members was trying to frighten me. So I turned around and looked behind the couch. I peeked into the hallway. I called out for them, but there was absolutely no one there. My sister came from outside of her room asking what I needed while we both watched as my parents came inside from the garage. I thought it best not to mention this to anyone, but as I sat back down and grabbed the remote to try and switch it back to the original channel I was watching, I became intrigued. I would wanted to hear what the music was, so I pressed the volume button to turn it up. The volume raised about two notches before the remote stopped working in my hand. I just stared at the TV in confusion as the volume bar began decreasing. Remote in my hand, no buttons being pressed. TV in front of me, no one manually pressing buttons, all family members accounted for. My sister took notice of what was going on, and the volume finally decreased to zero. Once again, I began to try my luck with the remote to turn the volume up or switch the channel. and Still, it wasn't working. The remote wasn't dead as we soon found out. About five minutes later, it began working again as if nothing had ever happened. Everyone was a bit unsettled, so we didn't speak further on the matter and just went to bed soon after. A week ago, curiosity got the better of me, and I scrolled through our TV guide to track down the music channel. I found it, had a listen, and was further amazed when my grandmother heard the music and stated that it was exactly what my grandfather loved to listen to.
when he was alive. About two months ago, my best friend and I made plans to hang out. She's been my best friend for more than 10 years. I'm a year older, and she used to break down in crowded places and was bullied when we were in school together, so I am fiercely protective of her. I'm seriously, you fuck with this girl, you fuck with me. The state we live in has a high rate of human trafficking, which makes me even more vigilant and particularly sensitive to this event. Our favorite mall is a great place to hang out on weekdays, as it's not too particularly crowded. That's the way we like it. There's so much to do there that when we go, we usually pick a movie time and spend the time before it shopping, snacking, and exploring. We were there all day, and she was pretty aloof that day. I, however, felt on edge and unfriendly. I'm usually not like that, but chalked it up to just being a bit cranky after getting rained on. My mom has drilled it into me to always be aware of my surroundings, and I've always been good at remembering names and faces. So when we saw people in the mall more than once, I usually remembered when I saw them, how many times I saw them, and where. Bestie and I stopped at one of those shops to get smoothies and sat down at a table to take a rest. It's a big mall, and we were walking all day, so I welcomed the rest. While we were in line... I saw a man cut through the shop and walk behind us. The shop was a corner shop with open entryways, so when I say cut through, he walked between us and a pillar. There was that on-edge feeling again. I became tense and immediately checked to make sure I hadn't been pickpocketed. I had all my stuff, so I tried to relax, and we were waiting for our drinks to be made, and I saw the man walk by us again, this time slower and around the pillar. There was nothing particularly scary about him. I mean, average height, build, kind of a dad bod. Jeans, dark button-up, short haircut. But I immediately just wanted him to go away. I told Bestie that I would grab us a table. I sat where she and I could see one another while she waited for our drinks. And I kept my eyes on her in case he came back. While she was getting our drinks, I saw the guy come back. This time, not alone. He was with two other men. They all seemed similar in age, all wearing jeans, one in a denim jacket and hat, the other in a white shirt with a gold chain on his neck, and the cologne they wore was overwhelming. They kind of made me think of middle-aged men who go to clubs to hit on girls. However, my internal voice was screaming, these guys are fucking pimps. Bestie joined me at the table, and we immediately started on our drinks and cookies we bought at our favorite cookie shop. I relaxed a moment, and while I was happily munching away, guess who comes around the corner again? I wait until they pass, and then lean in and tell Bestie what's going on. Me. Don't be alarmed, but those guys keep walking by us. Bestie. What guys? As she's asking, they come around the corner again. Me whispering, Them! We both remain quiet until they pass. Now that we're together, they slow down when passing our table. This makes me think that either she's their intended target, or they just think now that we're together, we'll be distracted. I try not to alarm her, but I've seen these guys hanging around other stores we've been in that day. She watches them go and is quiet for a moment. Bestie, don't overthink it, Loopy. Maybe they're just mall walkers. Me? (sighs) Maybe? She tries to cheer me up by talking about the movie we plan to see, and how she's happy we can get into a dine-in theater. I know this is her way of trying to protect me by distracting me, but while she's double-checking showtimes, all I can think of is how my mom told me to use an umbrella as a weapon. I tried to smile and brush things off for both our sakes, but while she's checking showtimes, guess who comes back around the corner? She's nose deep in her phone, so I turn my upper body towards them, scowling and making sure I look each of them in the eye as they walk by. I had my phone in my hands and got the sudden idea to hold it up like I was taking pictures or video. The guys sped up a bit, and White Shirt looked back at me as they went by. I watched until they were out of sight, 
and we didn't see them again for the rest of the night. The mood improved, we had fun, but I broke down about it to my mom later. She assured me that I did the best I could in that situation, but that night we came up with a danger code in case I was ever snatched from somewhere. So creepy mall walkers who I'm not convinced were just mall walkers, let's not meet. And if you touch my best friend, you'll have to kill me before I kill you. I live in New York, about 45 minutes to an hour north of New York City. No, we don't have skyscrapers up this way. But we have lots of greenery, apple orchards, pumpkin patches, the home of Seabiscuit and George Washington's first headquarters. We're rich in history, farmers, and slums up this way. I was raised in a slum ghetto up here, about 10 minutes away from the nearest farm. Can you guess which city? Probably not. But I'll give you an obvious hint. Can you say OC choppers? So, anyway, my first experience was back in 2006, I think. I can't really recall the specific year. My family home had a fire, and we had to move back down to Rockland County. I think I was 15 or 16, maybe. My mother, brother, and I were on our way back to the old home on Haverstraw from a family gathering in the Bronx. My grandpa had died the same day of the fire or the day before. So, on the way back from the gathering, something was said that ticked my mother off, and she pulled into a gas station, clicked off my seatbelt, reached over me and told me, Get the fuck out of my car and walk home. In tears at dusk, I get out of her car, and I'm so upset at this point, but there's nothing I can do but abide by her wishes. So, here are a few small details. That gas station? It's the one of two in an intersection that is easily six miles away from Haverstraw. Number two, the way home? Six miles, maybe more, on a dark, windy, two-lane highway, which was so dark I had to use my Nokia cell phone to see where I was going. Number three, I was wearing a denim miniskirt, short sleeve top, and some Air Forces. (laughs) Perfect victim wear. Four, My mother and I have a tumultuous relationship, and that day it was really bad. I'm still currently estranged from her, like I'll never allow her back in my life type of relationship. Back to abiding by my ever-so-wise mother's wish. I get out, begging her not to leave me, but I begin to walk as she peels away. A lady smoking a cigarette by her car says, Hey, sweetheart, you okay? Me, I'll be okay. Can I have one of those? The lady looked at me, asked my age, and then said, Never mind, a mom wouldn't let a baby walk home dressed like that. I knew what she was passively asking, but I was not going to offer her my age when I desperately was in need of a cigarette at this point. I also knew I wasn't dressed inappropriately. I mean, yeah, it was a mini skirt, but it was hot as balls that day, except now post-dusk and it was really effing dark and getting cold up in the mountains. The lady gave me two cigarettes in her lighter and said, God bless. At the time in my mind, I'm thinking, fuck a bless, give me a ride. So I said thank you and was on my merry way. I lit the first smoke and started walking. As I'm walking towards Haverstraw, I'm making observations I've never noticed before. Like, wow, this road is insanely dark. Why aren't there any lamppost lights? I'm talking, I can't see my hand in front of my face dark. So I pull out my Nokia and light my way, making sure I stay near the guardrail and off the road so nobody hits me. But if you're familiar with this area, then you know I can't walk off the road on either side of the rail because it has a ditch running alongside them. I stop, clip the cigarette, and proceed to walk. I'd stopped crying at this point and was actually starting to sing. I'm talking really singing because it was dark. I was alone, and I was not into the thought of possibly getting run over by a deer and getting mauled by a bear, or being prey to a wolf. (laughs) Yeah. So, go me. My song was Make It Through the Rain by Mariah Carey. I'm at the end of the song when I start smelling this nasty, pungent aroma that had me gagging. It was so gross. And then I had this thought that made me pray, oh, please don't let it be a dead girl. 
My imagination went wild, all the thoughts of finding a person on the side of the road, and the length of time it took me to find what had me traumatizing myself with all these what-ifs. I started to curse my mom with every swear in my mental archive. It was, of course, a deer, but oh my god, was it gross. So I lit that cigarette back up to mask the smell of decomposition. At this point, no car has passed me at all. I'd been walking for 25 minutes or more, and not even dear old mummy circled back for her young. My mind started to become paranoid. Mind you, this was the only way for me to get home. This road. No shortcut, just straight through. And what if I'm in danger? What if somebody is lurking beyond the trees? If somebody wanted me, they could get me. I'm a perfect victim, and I could end up on the side of the road like that deer. Deadass. It was like meant to be for my thoughts to be that way because all of a sudden, a truck pulled up next to me. The cabin light was turned on, and it was a red pickup truck with a two-seat cabin. I can clearly see across to this old man. I can also see somewhat in the flatbed. Now, when I say old man, remember, I'm 16 at the time, and old is much older than 16. He had salt and pepper hair, and these beautiful eyes, and a stepdad look to him, and a strong build to his shoulders. Need a ride? Never talk to strangers, right? No, thank you. I appreciate the offer. What's a pretty little thing like you doing out here in the dark? You're a little too young to be out at this time, don't you think? Yeah, he called me pretty. I've seen this on Lifetime before. I'm dead. Yeah, you're right, but my house is a couple of driveways down. Nice call. There are homes on the bottom of the mountain. You can run for it if you need to, but you have no clue how far the next driveway is, and you're on the wrong side of the road, genius. He looked at me and said, Come on, I'll drive you to your house. You're on the wrong side of the road anyways. I about died when he said that. I was wondering all the time this was going down if I was speaking my thoughts out loud, and his face showed he was going to be persistent in persuading me to hop in his truck. Needless to say, that clip burned out, so I lit the second cigarette while taking a good long look at his face and build. I couldn't see the model or make of the vehicle because he was literally hugging me to the rail. I mean, any more and I would have been pinned. This is when I also peeked into the bed of his pickup. I mean, side note, this may be brazen, but at this point, my NYPD uncle's words came to me about us, us meaning his nieces, being in situations like this. I mean, one, always know your captor's description. Two, what kind of vehicle is he driving, if he's driving? Three, if you're taken, fight like hell and take some DNA with you. Four, don't quit. Quitting is death. Be smart about your next move. I mean, he had had one too many when he told me this, but I still carry these words around. So I take a deep inhale of my cigarette, knowing it's going to be my last, and I give him an angelic smile. I blow the smoke in his face and say as convincingly as possible while looking in his eyes, Look, I want to thank you so much for your help, but I'm really close to home and my boyfriend will be coming down this road any minute to meet me there. You're kind of holding me up from my curfew, too. My parents are going to be pissed as shit. His eyes got dark. Telling the story right now is really creeping me out, because it's as if I'm there on that dark road again. He says, Yeah, okay and pulls off. No cars yet except him, and while this whole thing is happening, I'm praying, wishing, hoping for a car, preferably a state trooper, to pass by and see this guy idling. So I'm watching him pull away and quickly glancing again into his truck bed for unwanted people. I glance at my SIG and noticed it went out, so I lit it up again, cupping the flame. I look up, and the bastard has stopped almost 50 feet away. So now I'm in full panic mode. I start walking super slow and start planning to cross the road and run down the mountainside to the nearest house with lights. But what about spiders? Oh, fuck, spiders. This is your life, kid. Get it together. I'm counting my steps. One, two, three, four. Run on ten, girl. You will survive tonight. Five, six. Another car pulls up to me. The window rolls down, and this gorgeously delicious-looking man looks at me and says in a stern voice, 
Get in now. He didn't have to tell me twice. I flick my cigarette, get in the car, and he reaches over and clicks my seatbelt. This is insane, I think to myself. I mean, this guy could be the real kidnapper. He could be my killer, and now I'm fucked. He peels off and flips off the guy in the truck, and he says to me, How old are you? You shouldn't be out here at this time, and you shouldn't talk to strangers. I said, Ditto. So, are you going to kill me? Tell me the truth, please, because I just want to prepare myself. No, I'm your knight in shining armor, love. That guy in the pickup? A girl just jumped out of the bed of his flatbed at the gas station a couple miles back saying she needed help and to call 911 because she'd been kidnapped. I was immediately nauseous and began to see black spots behind my eyelids. He must have sensed my inner turmoil because he grabbed my hand and said, I was at the counter when all this happened. I overheard a lady telling 911 that there was a young lady walking all alone down the road and he peeled out of the parking lot going towards Haverstraw. I flew down this road to find you, and I'm glad I did, or you could have been his victim. Now, where can I drop you off? I should have got his name, number, and then married him, but I will never forget that man who saved my life. I'm an 18-year-old male from Cleveland, Texas. The city's quite small, and our school district only just became a 4A district, which, for those of you who don't know what 4A means, it just states the size of the district. 4A is a middle-sized district. Anyway, with how small the city is, I'm sure you can imagine the rumors that go around. Especially seeing as if you know one person, you practically know everyone. So there's one rumor that a lot of the elders believe, and to be honest, I think I do too especially after what I'm about to tell you. According to the stories the elders tell of the forest surrounding the city, out there is a beast man. I'll tell you the story that was told to me when I was young. About the year 1997, there was a couple that decided to go hunting in the woods surrounding the city. They said that they'd be out there for four days. A day and a half in, the wife decided that she didn't like the outdoors and told her husband she was going home. He told her that he was fine and he would be back on the fourth day, and that if she came looking for him, his camp would not move. So the wife gathered her things and went home. She had gone about her daily life up until the fourth day, when the husband had never come home. So, like any normal person, she got worried and went to the camp. Keep in mind that this was a time when phones were still bricks, and not very popular. After arriving at the camp, she found everything normal. The fire had been put out, and all the gear was packed and ready to go. The thing that wasn't normal was her husband. He wasn't there. She'd called his name several times to no avail, and finally she went back to town to get help. She drove to the local police station and got help from a family friend in the forest. After looking for a whole day and still unable to find her husband, they filed a missing persons report and sent a search party the next day. Towards the end of that day, someone found him, dead. His clothes were all torn in two, and he had lacerations all over him. His chest was hollowed out from the bottom of the ribcage all the way up to his sternum. His stomach had been ripped open. Where they found him was in a nest. Apparently, the nest looked like a buzzard's nest, but big enough for four grown men to sit in, and it was on the ground. There were bones everywhere, even strung in the trees like wind chimes. An investigation was launched that day. The lacerations looked to be that of a large cat. The eaten out stomach and chest were said to be the work of a dog. During the time the scene was being investigated, police reported seeing strange things in the woods, like a person watching them from just beyond the tree line that disappeared and seeing an animal where they last saw it. Each time... It was a different animal. They also reported hearing what sounded like a person trying to roar like a bear and howl like a wolf all in one go. The local police force was unable to figure out what had killed the man. They also tried to cover up the investigation, but with the town being so small, 
things don't go unnoticed. Skipping forward 12 years, I decided to go camping with a couple of friends out in those same woods. We were planning on staying out there for three days, but it got cut short. It was the first night, and we were all sitting around the fire talking about video games. One in particular was an RPG called Skyrim. Suddenly, a man in an orange vest holding a hunting rifle showed up, and he said he was out there to hunt for pigs and asked us to keep it quiet as to not disturb him or scare off the animals. So as the unarmed people we were, we politely said yes, and then we all went to sleep. We were woken up in the middle of the night from the sound of the hunter's gun. We heard the gun go off three times in a row, back to back, before it subsided. We all shrugged it off and went back to sleep, or that's what I thought. Apparently one of the guys I was with decided he was too nervous to go back to sleep. In the morning, we all decided to gather our things and head out. We didn't want to stay out there so long as there was someone hunting so close by. Three days later, on the local Cleveland News, they had a report of a story of a hunter found dead in the woods, mauled by an unknown creature, lying in a very large nest, surrounded by bones. When they showed a picture of the man who died, it was the same man we saw that night. I called the guys I was with that night and told them about this new information. The one that had stayed up that night had told me he heard what sounded like a very high-pitched roar while we were all asleep. He said he didn't want to tell us because he didn't want to freak us out. When he said that, I instantly remembered the story of the couple back in 1997. I never believed that story, until now. Don't take the stories your grandparents tell you for granted. Not only are those stories their legacy but it's also their advice and warnings to us younger generations. A Boy Scout Story Submitted by Stephen the Blue This is a little bit different, but it was scary as F when it happened. I was 10 years old attending a scout camp in 1979. I won't name the place, but I'll let you know that it is in Massachusetts. It was and is a cool place for kids to go camping, but the time that I was there that August, I got more than I bargained for. We all did. It was a Friday, and the next to the last day of my week there. It started out fairly normal, but gray and a little windy, and made for a rotten day on the lake as far as boating and swimming. But we were all trying to make the best of our last full day there before heading home. There were guys all over the place finishing up merit badge requirements and such, and I was with three of my buddies out in the woods finishing a wildlife observation for my mammals badge. Honestly, I think we were just making up stuff to meet the qualifications and probably planning on taking a long nap out in the woods. I remember it got really dark really fast, and the wind started to pick up even more. My friend Larry said we should probably head for shelter as it looked like a pretty serious storm was coming. And then it hit. The rain was intense and some of the heaviest I recall ever in my life. After reminiscing about this day with my friends, we all kind of remember it a little differently. And with time, it's hard to know what version of the story is the most accurate. <laughs> hey, I'm in my 50s now and things are getting foggy. Anyway, we started hightailing it back to the campsites. And there were scout leaders trying to get everyone organized and accounted for when suddenly I heard what sounded like a train coming at us. Not a whistle or whatever, but just this loud wall of sound. Scouts were running around looking to get to buildings as it was obvious what was happening at this point. Larry, Jeff, and I crawled under our canvas tent platform, and we could see other guys in our troop doing the same thing. The sound got louder and louder, and we could hear trees cracking and breaking, and stuff was flying all over the place. I buried my face to the dirt to protect it from the little rocks and sticks that were zooming through the air, but I did look up for one second to see three tents across from us go shooting off into the woods with the cots and everything else inside. I also remember seeing the bodies of my pals lying under the platforms like us. The sound of the tornado was so deafening I thought my ears were going to burst, and we just lay there, holding on and hoping we were going to be okay. 
and what seemed like forever, but was really probably just a couple of minutes, things died down, but the rain kept up, and we could still hear the creak and crack of the trees and such. Then the yelling started. Campers crying, some of them hurt by flying debris, and others just really shook up. We crawled out from under the platforms and just stood there, kind of dazed. The tornado hadn't come right through our sight, but it came close enough to knock everything all over the place, and it was a total mess. No one in our troop was hurt that bad. In fact, I recall some guys getting extra credit on their first aid merit badges as they went into action helping others out when they retrieved their first aid kits. Our scoutmaster, Mr. Taylor, tallied up everyone and everyone in our troop was accounted for and safe. Larry and Jeff and I were just still totally dazed, and I guessed everyone else was too. Two guys in another troop, however, didn't make it. They were killed by falling trees and had unfortunately been right in the path of the tornado. When we learned about this, parents were called and everyone was going home or leaving for medical treatment if they needed it. The really scary thing is, the tornado cut right through a portion of the forest where we had been sitting looking for squirrels and whatever. I mean, if we had been out there for even a minute or two more, I'm positive we never would have made it out of there alive. Those two poor kids. It was so sad. I remember we had their names and there was some sort of tribute to them. But again, like so much else, all of it has faded. I'd be lying if I said I was friends with them, but I do know we all saw them throughout the week and such. And so sad. Just kids, and wiped off the map, just like that. People say it over and over that real-world stuff is always scarier than the paranormal. I've seen a lot of stuff I can't explain over the years. But that by far was the scariest thing I have ever been through. If you've never heard a tornado up close, it's unreal and so loud, you really have to hear it for yourself just to understand how intense it is. They say that campground still has those two kids as ghost campers, and people see them from time to time. I never went back and left scouts not long after that. Hands down, a terrifying day. My Bigfoot Story, submitted by Timothy Scott Couch. I'm from the beautiful Green Mountains of southeast Kentucky, Our small town is surrounded by miles and miles of thick, unsettled land, some places men probably have never even seen. As an outdoorsman growing up, I spent a lot of my time digging roots, hunting, and fishing. I consider myself pretty smart when it comes to wildlife, but there was nothing like I had ever seen the day I saw what I saw. The sun was shining through the trees, and it was a beautiful summer day. Me and my uncle and cousin had decided to hike about 20 miles in some virgin land to go after some ginseng, or sanjing as we call it out back in the mountains. We had reached our destination and spread out, all within eyesight, up and down the hill, combing the area for any nice old four-prongs, digging a few here and there. When you're in the mountains, you have to learn to be aware, listen more, speak rarely, notice everything. If not... A rattlesnake, mountain lions, bears, or copperheads might find you first. I kept noticing my uncle looking back over his shoulder every few minutes and thought it odd, but decided not to mention it until we were closer together. After a while, my ears started hearing faint sounds as if something walking close by was there, but staying out of view. That crunching, and then a few limbs cracking. I was super aware something wasn't right when my uncle waved us all together for lunchtime. We sat and ate our sandwiches and drank some water, comparing the amount of roots we had each dug, and it had been a good day so far. We knew it was going to get better. We must have hit a honey hole where no one had ever been in a long, long time. Suddenly, my uncle looked behind us and was scanning the ground. I heard it too, that thumping again, like two trees hitting each other. Have you heard it following us? he asked. Yeah, I said. I've been listening to it. I wonder what it is. Maybe a bear or a big cat, he said. Let's be careful. We loaded up and headed deeper up into the mountains. 
The ginseng we were finding was now in big bunches everywhere we looked. I had just spotted one up ahead. We had gotten a bit separated, filling our pockets, but we all knew how to handle ourselves and how to call for help if needed. We used bird calls or bird whistles that drew less attention if we spotted other people ginsenging in our area. We would turn back because not everyone you meet 20 miles back in the mountains are nice, and everyone carries a gun out there. So as I was making my way to this monster root, a smell hit my nose. It was familiar. It was death. Probably a deer that had been shot and wandered off to die, I figured. So I made my way to the smell as it got stronger and stronger. It was almost unbearable. I noticed the rest of my group were heading in the same direction. The smell must have caught their attention as well. What I walked up on first was a dog, probably wild. Its jaws had been ripped loose at the hinges. Nothing much gone from the carcass, and it was no more than a few weeks old. I had never seen something like this before. I mean, usually nature takes care of itself, and food is eaten. But this was different. From the first corpse I saw, I could see another, fresher corpse, not decomposed at all. And I made my way over to it, fearing we had come upon a bear kill site. It was a deer. A doe, probably 200 pounds. Its neck was broken up under its body, and none of it was fed upon. It looked like another sport kill for something. Whatever it was, it was clearly territorial, and I realized I was in its home now. I heard a whistle, and I knew that meant to move my ass and find the group. They were close by, maybe 20 yards ahead of me, and I made my way to them as quickly as I could. Look here, they said. The whole area for about 200 feet in front of us was clear. No shrubs, maybe some small trees broken down, and the ground was bare. I mean, there were no weeds or anything at all. Nothing, that is, except another 12 to 15 dead animals, maybe even more. They were all lying around everywhere, almost like decorations. A Rottweiler, maybe 150 pounds, solid black, laid there, fresh. It looked like something had just picked it up and snapped it over its knee, breaking its spine and neck. Several of the other animals were fresh, and many of them were decaying, a few simply just pounds on the ground. Whatever we had stumbled on had been there for a while, and we knew that we had not been invited. That thumping sound came again, but now it was a lot closer. My uncle looked at me with a mix of fear and confusion in his eyes and said, Let's go. We turned down the hill and were walking as fast as we could, but you could still hear those footsteps coming behind us. It was following. My uncle looked back and then picked up the pace, and we were almost running now down the hill, back in the direction of safety from this unseen killer. <laughs> we made it home late that evening and sat around over a cup of hot coffee discussing what we had found and what we had seen. We all agreed. None of us had ever seen anything like it. What I never told anyone was about halfway out, I had looked back for a brief second, and I saw something. It stood about six feet tall and was very broad, covered in blackish hair and standing on two legs watching us. I wondered if it was a bear, but I have seen bears, and whatever this was, it was different. I will always think we wandered into the home of a very territorial Bigfoot. So to all of you out there venturing into the mountains, remember, watch, listen, and always be on your guard, because many times there is something watching us as well. My Uncle, submitted by Godfather's Pizza. Some of you might not think that this is scary, but this time of year always reminds me of something that happened when I was growing up. I figured, what the hell, I'll send it in and see if you'll read it. When I was growing up, my aunt and uncle on my dad's side were two of my favorite people, and my cousin Sarah was also great. She was older than me and would babysit me and my sister when their family was in town visiting, and the parents wanted to go out. Uncle Steve was a lot of fun, too. 
He always bought us cool toys and sports stuff and then played with us. One time it was some board game which he thought was the greatest thing of all time. If it was a soccer or basketball, he'd get us outside for a game with my dad while my mom and aunt did what moms and aunts do. We went on camping trips together, we always got together on holidays, and I have to say, all of us together had some great, great times growing up. When I was 15, things took a turn. Sarah was in college down south when my Aunt Jackie had the accident. It was winter, and when she was driving home in a pretty bad snowstorm, she lost control of her vehicle at an intersection and slid on ice. Her car jumped the curb, slammed into a middle-aged woman who was standing there, and killed her on the spot. Her car also hit a light pole that came down on her car and caused massive injuries to her, and sadly, she died a week later. My uncle went into a tailspin when this happened. Obviously, he was devastated, and it took a while for him to put things back together again. He went on a serious drinking binge at the time and just couldn't get past the hurt and sadness of his love being gone. They'd been together since they were 14, and he just kind of lost his mind. Sarah did her best to help keep things together, but he was insistent that she continue her schooling when she was able. He loved her so much, too, and didn't want her to miss out on life. My dad went out to stay with him for a bit and got him back up and running, and things started to look a little sunnier in a gloomy time. But then came the lawsuit from the family of the woman. They sued my father for the death of her wife when it came out that Aunt Jackie had been at a work party before the accident and had a couple of drinks. She was by no means drunk, but there was enough evidence to prove that she was on the edge of the legal limit, and combined with her rate of speed, not being able to control the vehicle despite the conditions, the verdict was given to the family. Insurance didn't cover it. Uncle Steve was destroyed. They took everything, and he still owed on top of that. He declared bankruptcy and went back into another tailspin. We didn't hear from him for a long time despite my dad reaching out and even going out to see him. So, this brings us to when I was 17. One night in February, Uncle Steve showed up at our farmhouse. He looked good, but kind of tired. He'd been moving around trying to find himself after all of this, and sometimes Sarah didn't even know where he was. I noticed a taxi backing out of the driveway, so I realized he didn't have a car. And that's kind of important for later, and I hope all this front end will shed light on what happens in this story. I was glad to see him, but frankly, I was 17, and more than a little mired in hoops, my girlfriend and my classes at school to have more than a happy-to-see-him feeling. He stayed with us for a couple of days, and then my dad pulled me and my brother aside and let us know that Uncle Steve was going to stay with us for a while to get back on his feet. Dad was going to help him find some work and then get him his own place. We were pretty happy about that, because Uncle Steve had been helping us with our homework, and he was even helping me work on my car. My grandfather had recently given me his old 1972 Dodge Dart Swinger, and I was keeping it in shape and driving it to and from school in my part-time job at a record store. Not the sexiest of old cars, but I thought it was awesome. So, Uncle Steve looked for work, helped out around the house, and seemed to be relaxed and ready to start the next chapter of his life. For about a month, he'd been working for a contractor doing up blueprints for new housing builds, and it was looking like he would be expanding his role in that company. Everyone was really happy for him. One day, I was doing laundry and saw a pile on the floor in the spare bedroom he was using in the basement, and I thought I'd be a good guy and wash his clothes for him. I grabbed the stuff and took it to the machine when I noticed a pair of jeans had dark stains all over them. I took another look and right away knew it was blood. I didn't freak out. I mean, maybe something happened at work to cause the blood to get on him, so into the wash they went. That night, he came home from work with my dad and went downstairs. I'd left the clean stuff on his bed, and the stains hadn't come out all the way, and I just left a note saying, sorry. He came upstairs to dinner and didn't say anything, but later that night, after I came home from studying at my girlfriend's, he caught me on the way to my room. 
Did you wash my clothes? He asked. I laughed and said, yeah, and then apologized again. He immediately grabbed my arm and said, stay the hell out of my stuff, got it? I was taken aback. He went from smiling and cool to wicked violent in about 0.4 seconds. I just went into my room, and this was the first thing in a chain of events that ended on Easter afternoon. Uncle Steve started to get really weird, coming and going at night and using my father's truck. I'd hear him come in at like 3 in the morning and head to the basement, but I never said anything. One evening, my girlfriend was over and we were going to binge on horror movies, and Uncle Steve asked if he could borrow my car as my parents were out. I said sure, and he took the keys and was gone for hours. I mean, so long, my girlfriend's parents had to come and get her. When I saw him the next day, he apologized and said he got caught up in a poker game with some work buddies and he just forgot the time. No big deal, I thought. Three days later, three days before Easter, I was leaving work at the record store and got pulled over by the police. I didn't know what I did wrong, but they had the spotlight shining on me and told me to keep my hands on the wheel and all that stuff you see on TV. They made me get out of the car and had my hands on the hood as they frisked me, and I was going out of my head. I mean, I had no idea what was going on. They put me in a car, I told them I wasn't answering any questions until my parents got there, and they said they knew that, and they were in the process of getting them. My dad came flying out, demanding to know what was going on, and we got the skinny. A woman had been raped over the weekend and nearly killed. She was found by a jogger who got her some help, but her description of her attacker was weak. Her memory of the car, though, was spot on. It was mine. I mean, how many 72 darts were driving around in 1993? They asked us a ton of questions right there, and then let me go with my dad, but they wanted to look over my car, which, against my wishes, my dad let them do. On the way home, I was really upset, and my dad was telling me it was going to be okay, and I blurted out, Uncle Steve had my car on Saturday night, Dad. His eyes turned to slits and he stepped on the gas. We pulled into the house and he told me to stay in the truck as he went inside. He came out five minutes later with the cordless phone in his hand and he waved me in from the garage. Less than ten minutes later, our house was swarming with cops, focusing mostly on the basement. Uncle Steve was gone, along with some of his stuff, but there were a lot of things there, including a box that had a few pairs of torn panties and condoms. My head was swirling around. The police asked my family all kinds of questions, as a group and one-on-one. -on -one. I told them about the time I found the bloody jeans and how Uncle Steve reacted, and my brother brought up how he would leave the house and come back at weird times. They took tons of pictures and took most of Uncle Steve's stuff with my parents' permission. This seemed to take all night. And by 2 a.m., they left and told us to rest after barricading the basement bedroom and asking us to stay out of there. Uncle Steve never came back to the house. My mom decided we weren't staying there at all, and we were going to my grandparents across town for the next few days, and we'd spend Easter there. On Good Friday, the police contacted my dad and told him that we could get my car. In all of this craziness, I really just wanted my car back the initial shock of things was wearing off. Sarah came home a complete wreck when she found out what was going on, but she decided to stay the weekend with us. My dad and I went and got my car and went back to my grandparents after I picked up my girlfriend. I hadn't seen her since that last weekend and had only told her a little bit about what was going on over the phone. My dad was constantly taking calls from the police, and the creep factor came back into things. Easter Sunday dawned, and we were all getting ready for church, when I looked out the front window of my grandparents' house. I'd been sleeping in the living room with my brother, and I saw that my car was not in the driveway. I ran for my dad, who was in the shower. He jumped out, and of course he immediately called the police. The family went to church while he and I stayed to talk to the police about this, but they wouldn't or couldn't say what they had been working on. Around noon, we found out. 
They found my car. It was in a supermarket parking lot, crashed into the side of it, but still running. Why? Well, because the police had been chasing the driver, my Uncle Steve. He'd made a set of keys and snuck over to my grandparents in the night and taken it hoping to get out of town. But like an idiot, he stayed in town long enough for a cop in a patrol car to see him, identify him, and then radio it in. They obviously had the description of my car, too. Holy cat shit, this is long. Alright, here's what happened. My Uncle Steve had some problems. When he was traveling around after my aunt's death, he started raping random women in whatever town he was in. There were five in all before he came to live with us. The authorities pieced all of that together after a lengthy investigation. In our town, he raped two women. One woman was a lady he picked up in a bar and drove her to a nearby park. He got her out of the car for a walk in the woods. The other woman he had attacked never got a good look at him because he wore a ski mask. But with this woman that he drove to the park, she was so drunk she couldn't remember him clearly, but the car was crystal clear in her memory. He choked her and left her for dead, but he hadn't gone all the way, and that's when the jogger found her. When Uncle Steve had heard that I had gotten pulled over, he got an idea of what was going on, and when my dad came out to get me from the police, he got some of his stuff and left. He stayed locked in a motel room for the next few days before thinking he could steal my car on Easter and that there wouldn't be so many people out and about that morning. He'd make a clean getaway and ditch the car later. How did he know we were at my grandparents? As he was leaving our house, we were just pulling up, so he hid in a space underneath a bay window of our living room. It was a secret hiding place I think I showed him when I was a kid on one of his visits. So, he overheard a lot of stuff going on, and that piece of information was one of them. Anyway, back to Easter Sunday. Uncle Steve was getting pulled over, so he gunned it and led the police on a chase to the supermarket. Thinking that he could lose them in the parking lot there, he missed a turn, crashed my car, got out and ran for a bridge over train tracks that was right next door to the parking lot. The police gave chase, but midway across the bridge, Uncle Steve stopped and ended things for good. He jumped over to the side, and that was that. It was at least 80 feet down. So, yeah, that was not an easy time at all, and in Easter, I'd rather forget. The thing is, they knew he was connected to the seven rapes, but how many others had he maybe gotten away with where there was no connection? He was on the road for so long, I shudder to think what kinds of things he did out there. I'm a grown man now, with almost grown children, and the memory of this still bothers me. If anyone's wondering, my grandfather and I fixed up the dart. I still have it, and I'm giving it to my son for his graduation. The moral of this story is exactly what you say at the end of every video. The craziest stuff can happen anywhere, to anyone, by anyone. So this truly is a, you really never know the guy next door story. Uncle Steve was always such a loving and wonderful father, husband, brother, and uncle. But then again, and again I shudder to think, maybe he really was this monster all along, and we just never knew it. Perhaps that's what scares me the most. Perhaps I never really knew my Uncle Steve. It can be dangerous out there. Submitted by Grandpa Joe Sucks. Thanks for asking for scout stories. I'm hoping this one will work for you, and I haven't told it to anybody in a long time. I was a scout in Florida when I was in middle and high school. I think I was a tenderfoot or something at the time, and some of the guys in my troop were all working on the same merit badges, and we thought we'd kill a couple with one stone on an overnight in my friend's backyard. Well, really the forest land that ran behind and around it. He lived on the edge of a drying swamp, but there was nothing for miles, just trees and stuff around his dead-end street. Dave, Colin, and I were working on camping and cooking badges, but Ryan had already had his and was working on birding or something like that, which we all thought was hilarious. At our troop meeting, 
We asked our scoutmaster about it, and he said he'd call our fathers to see how they felt about it. Not that he didn't think we'd lie to him about anything. He was just being a good leader. He was a great guy and really took the time to get to know all of us and include our families on the stuff we did. I heard he passed away not too long ago, which is a shame. He was a really nice guy. But back to the story. Our parents were all cool as long as we didn't go too far into the tree land and Colin's father would check on us at night to make sure we were okay. We planned for a Saturday night two weeks from the time we were given permission and then worked on all the other things you have to with merit badges, like the plans and sharing them with our counselor. Colin and his father had gone out into the tree land and about two miles out, they found a great spot for us. Part of merit badges that sound easy like camping and cooking actually have a lot of qualifications, such as how far you need to hike or making shopping lists and going shopping for the supplies. Everything has to be checked off or you don't get the merit badge. They are kind of involved for 13-year-old kids, but that's part of it. Just writing that in case anybody didn't know. So we met at Collins' house that Saturday morning and got all of our gear together. It was only for one night and morning, so we got to travel pretty light. We also planned to sleep under the stars, so no pitching of tents on this trip, and we loved the idea of skipping that step just this one time. Our parents checked over all of our things, made sure we had one cell phone. This was 2004. Not every kid had one like today. Ryan had his mother's. They gave us the okay, and off we went on the route Colin and his father had picked out. I remember lots of laughing and talking about baseball, hot girls, and stuff, and we were all excited to be hanging together and having good old-fashioned clean fun. When we got to the spot, we did everything by the numbers, as our scoutmaster used to say. We got a fire pit ready after clearing out the brush, laid out our sleeping pads and bags, made a raised table for cooking and prep out of some dead logs, and were just telling jokes and laughing the whole time. When we got everything set up, We went exploring around the area for anything cool to see. Colin said there used to be a pond out there that had dried up, and Ryan wanted to check out the bird life. Armed with only our Swiss Army knives, we headed out to find this pond. After a bit of walking through the trees, we came to what looked like an old path. It certainly didn't look very used. Grass had grown up tall between the two tire track trails, and Colin thought that it led to the pond, but he wasn't totally sure. He got out his compass and looked around and said that we had to go in a direction away from our little camp. So we did. Sure enough, we came upon it, but of course there's not too much a pond that's dried up. It's not very exciting. There was, however, an old beat-up pickup truck that Colin did not remember ever being out there before. It was a rusted-out junker with the windows broken out, the tires were flat, seats all slashed up. You get the picture. What was odd to us, though, was a newer toolbox we found under a tarp in the back of the truck. It was one of those toolboxes that goes along the whole front of the box under the cab window. Dave and I tried to open it, but it was locked. I thought it was odd that a new toolbox would be in the back of a crappy old truck, and Colin said nobody ever really was out this way. There was no reason to be. I mean, it was just trees, dried swampy land, and some animals, and not really hunting animals either. What should we do? asked Ryan. Should we tell someone that it's out here? (laughs) What for? asked Dave. Let's try to pry it open. Maybe there's something cool inside. I said I didn't think that that was such a good idea, and Ryan brought up our scout oath and stuff. Right, save the comments, listeners. We were good kids. Colin agreed with Dave, and the two got to looking for rocks or whatever to try to break into the locks. (laughs) Genius thinking. It wasn't like they were padlocks. So they found some rocks and started wailing away on the toolbox, and it was making a ton of noise. They didn't get anywhere. They just bashed the crap out of the box with no payday. And during a break in the senseless project, we heard voices. Deep voices. Um, guys, let's get out of here. Follow me, said Colin, and he started running across the dead pond to some trees. We all followed him and ran into them just as some guys came up the path towards the truck. There were two of them, and when they got to the truck, they looked around. If it was their truck, they would obviously see that someone had been out there messing with things. The tarp was still on the ground, and the smash marks on the toolbox were dead giveaways. We overheard one of them say, 
Son of a bitch, look at this. As he pointed to the toolbox. Ryan had his binoculars for bird watching and was watching them as we hid. One of the guys opened the box and started taking stuff out as the other guy kept looking around the area. I can't see them really well. What are they doing? I whispered, and Ryan said they were taking out bags of something, and he said they both had guns. That's not very typical for Florida. Everybody has guns down here. But Colin said we needed to get out of there and said he would take us away from the pond and then we could work our way around them at a far distance so they wouldn't see us. The best laid plans, right? As soon as we started moving back into the trees, of course we made way too much noise, and both the guys heard us and yelled things out like, Hey, get back here! And we really started booking it. I looked back once and could see one of the guys was chasing us, but we just kept running. I don't know how we did it, but we got back to the camp and just crashed in a giant pile, covered in sweat and dirt from the run. It was summer and, hey, Florida weather, right? We sat there drinking water and talking about what had just happened. We said maybe Ryan should call for help, and we kicked that around. What for? I mean, those guys would be long gone, and we might get in trouble for trying to break into the toolbox. So we all just kind of relaxed and decided to just focus on our badge stuff. And if anyone asked, we didn't know anything about a truck. So much for the scout oath. Just before nightfall, Colin's father came out to check on us and stay for dinner we were going to cook. Ryan basked in the glory of not having to do anything as he had already had the badges I mentioned, and we all gave him a hard time for not pitching in. We were trying to play it cool in front of Colin's father. He finally left, told us to be safe, and then we just gathered around the fire for more talking and stuff. Around 11 o'clock, Dave was telling some dirty jokes. When he stopped and pointed his chin to the edge of our little camp. We all turned and looked, and there was a guy just standing there staring at us. I'm pretty sure we almost all soiled our britches when the guy came over to us in the firelight. He was scraggly looking with really long, greasy hair. He was wearing work boots and camo shorts with no shirt, and he was all sweaty and dirty. Hey guys, having a camp out? He asked, or something like that. He was smiling, but his eyes were looking at us a little too intensely. I, for one, was really uneasy. Uh, yeah, scout stuff, said Colin, and we all nodded. No kidding. I was a scout once. The guy just said that and kept staring. You guys been doing any uh, walking and exploring around out here? That can be dangerous, you know. We all just looked at him, and in my heart, I knew that this guy had to be one of the guys from the truck, and he knew that we were the ones that had been out there. Ryan jumped in, saying, Nah, we've all been busy doing scout stuff over here. You never see a table built like that? And he pointed to the cooktop that we'd built. Mm-hmm, said the guy. Well, if I were you, I'd stick to scout stuff, if you know what I mean. And you know what I mean. Ain't that right, Cable? The other names in the story I've changed, but that one I haven't, because I will never forget it. This other guy comes into the firelight from behind us, and this guy is really scary looking. He's dressed in camo, too, but he's got a gun on his hip and blood on his hands and arms. Yep, can be real dangerous out here, he said. And with that, he dropped four dead squirrels on the ground and gave us a hard stare. He held up three fingers in a scout salute and repeated, I do solemnly swear, it can get even more dangerous. We didn't say anything. The two guys looked at one another and then just walked away into the darkness. <laughs> that was it for us. Ryan scrambled for his phone and we called Colin's father. Torn between running into the night or staying put, we were happy to hear that Colin's father says to stay there. He was actually on his way back out to check on us again. We all breathed a sigh of relief that Dave's father was with him too. When they got to our camp, we all started talking at once and told them the whole story. To our surprise, they weren't really that mad. I mean, after all, it's not like we were trying to rob a bank or something. 
They stayed with us that night, and in the morning, they called the sheriffs and told them our story. In less than an hour, two came up on quads and asked us a bunch of questions, like what the guys looked like, what did the truck look like, where was it, and stuff. As a group, we went back to the truck, and they told us to stay put away from it, and then went over to it. They inspected things and talked to each other, and one came back to us and said, You boys got real lucky. This is some sort of stash for drug dealers, and I suggest you use your common sense next time and stay away from strange trucks. They asked the two fathers to come talk to them off to the side, and on our way home, they mentioned something about there being residues from pot, cocaine, and meth in the toolbox. Later, drug dogs would find another stash in a tree not too far away. We really dodged a bullet there, and we promised each other to stick to scout craft if we went out camping again. That brush with the two scary drug dealers was enough to scare us out of that for good. I miss scouts, but... I gotta say I'm kind of happy. I've got twin daughters who have zero interest in the outdoors, and for that, I'm kind of thankful. I'm sure they'll find their share of trouble on their own, but at least it won't be something like how we found it. <laughs>